All right. All right, Shabbat Shalom. You got the uh, document. Not yet. It's coming up. Okay. All right. Before we start, of course, we want to make sure that the audio and video are functioning properly. So let me know if it's clear. If not, we will adjust it. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so with that, we're gonna get into this Sabbath lesson. And because it is the Sabbath, we're gonna start off with the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. Shema Yasha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Akkad. Shema Yasha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Akkad. Shema Yasha Allah Ahaya Allah Hayanawa 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 Ahaya Akkad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So, brothers and sisters, again, welcome to another edition of the GOCC Sabbath lesson. Of course, I'm Brother and Elder Loya along with Brother and Elder Ganja. Shalom, shalom. And this, this Sabbath, we're going to be going into a lesson titled, Is Your Flesh Your God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what we're going to try to do with this lesson, um, of course, we're going to be dealing with a, uh, we're going to be dealing with the spiritual aspect of this lesson, lesson, the overall spiritual message of, Is Your Flesh Your God? But within the frame of this lesson, we're going to try our best to address uh, any points or any questions that may come up uh, within the course of the lesson. Usually, when we deal with any teaching, when we deal with any broadcast, we get a list of frequently asked questions, either it be through email, through the live chat. So what we're going to try to do within the frame of teaching the full spiritual message, we're also going to try to take some time out and address some of the questions that may come up within the lesson. Okay? So, brothers and sisters, please let the Most High come into your mind, let the Spirit come into your mind on the Sabbath. If there be any burdens, if there be anything from the prior week that has kept you uh, feeling burdensome and, and heavy, so on and so forth within the Spirit, ask the Most High to take it away that you may be able to receive today's lesson. Okay? So we're going to start off, we're just going to read the introduction so that you can get the, um, the understanding of the overall message that we want to try to relay throughout today's message, okay? Is your flesh your God? And Elder God, you can read that. Okay. <clears throat> In the world today, most make decisions strictly on how their own flesh perceive things and never think about what is necessary according to the most High for our daily existence. We have become a world of mindless robots who react based only on what our own demons expect, expect of us and what our flesh has grown fond of. In this life, it's there not more to live in, is there not more to live in than walking about confused and without true purpose? Good question. Mm -hmm. Most of the world relies on substance and empty activities that distract them from reality. The reality that there is a judgment for those who live according to the flesh. Are we any different in the truth being those who claim we can see or is our flesh also our God? Let's discuss the struggle. Absolutely. And this struggle that we're going to discuss is a struggle that is um, documented well documented all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And before we actually get into the book of Genesis, there's one particular point that I wanna bring out based on the introduction where it makes mention 
of uh, is there more to living than walking about confused and without true purpose? Now that stands out because the majority of people go through the, the, this transition of life without understanding what their true purpose is. We often ask ourselves, why was I placed on earth? What is my purpose? Well, we're gonna show you that purpose according to scripture. Okay, and we're going to start off first in the book of Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, and then we're going to get what you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the Bible makes it very clear as to what our purpose is as men and women within this earth. We're not put here to be entertainers. We're not put here to be bankers and doctors and lawyers, so on and so forth. Not to say that it's unlawful to be those things, but understand that that is not our ultimate purpose. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Mm -hmm. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Because before this verse, it makes mention of the making of many books and how there is no end. And with all of these books, all the study of all the different records that have ever entered into this earth. Trying to study those things is a weariness of the flesh, and it will eventually have you confused as to what your purpose is. So the Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Ahaya. Fear the Most High. And keep his commandments. And keep his commandments. Why? For well, this is the whole duty of man. Because this is the whole duty of man. This is our purpose to fear the Most High and keep his commandments. So whether I am a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman, a fireman, an entertainer, basketball player, football player, baseball player, soccer player, you name it in this earth, regardless of what profession I have obtained in this earth, I must understand that my overall purpose is to serve the Most High and keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. Let's get what you had. That's okay. I'll do it after going. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the book of Genesis, the ninth chapter, and we're going to start in verse number eight. The book of Genesis, chapter nine, verse eight. And the most I spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, for all that goeth out of the ark, to every beast of the earth. Right. And we discussed this this past academy uh, week, showing that the covenant, the original covenant that the Most High made after the flood was with Noah mm -hmm. and his three sons. Mm -hmm. Let's read that again in verse 8. Verse 8. And the Most High spake unto Noah and to his sons with him. So the Most High is speaking not only to Noah, but all of, of his sons also. Mm -hmm. So you have Noah and you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And he says what? Saying, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So I establish my covenant with you and with my seed after you. So there was a covenant that was established with Noah and his three sons. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to explain what that covenant is, and eventually, which of the three sons became the uh, heir of the righteous lineage. Okay, we're going to show how and why that became so. Mm -hmm. Let's read on. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle and every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, mm -hmm. verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Mm -hmm. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood. Mm -hmm. Neither shall there be there anymore be a flood to destroy the earth. Right. So this is the covenant that God made with Noah and his sons, that he would no longer destroy the earth by way of a flood. OK, now we also discussed the fact that, well, if all three sons are on the ark along with their father, Noah, and they all experienced this event known as the flood, that what? 
eventually, once they became scattered, what would happen? They would begin to write about it. Mm -hmm. So all of the sons of Noah would have an account of the flood. Which is why you find flood stories in every civilization on the earth. Why? Because their fathers was on the boat, so they wrote about it. Mm -hmm. So and and just adding, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know how people try to say, oh, well, the Bible is plagiarized. No, the Bible is an accurate account because when you go into even secular history, you'll find an account of the flood. It's just the Bible gives it from a Hebrew from a Hebrew perspective. Mm -hmm. Simple. Exactly. Okay. So all nations were present, or the fathers mm -hmm. of all nations were present at this event. Okay. It tells us that. In verse number uh, 19, that these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth over spread. Mm -hmm. So when they began to spread over the earth, they took with them the history and the account of the flood. Mm -hmm. OK, also, when you read Genesis nine, you find that all of the sons of Noah were taught specific commandments to keep. OK, mm -hmm. let's go over a few of them. Uh, let's jump up to about verse number three. Verses. Three. Mm -hmm. okay. Book of Genesis, chapter nine, verse three. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Right. So every living thing shall be meat for you. Now, some people may look at that and say, well, that must mean every creature, meaning that all of the sons of or before the time of Moses, the children of Noah on down ate anything that they thought was good for consumption okay so if they wanted to eat swine lobsters shrimps and anything else under the sun it was okay because the bible says that every living thing shall be meat for you well what you must take in consideration during this time period uh even before noah got onto the ark the most High made it clear that there were clean beasts and that there were unclean beasts you got it? Yes, sir. Let's read it. Book of Genesis, chapter 7, verse 2. Mm -hmm. Let me start at 1. And the, most I, and the most I said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 2. Of every clean beast. Of every what? Of every clean beast. Of every what? Of every clean beast. So the most High is making it clear to Noah of every clean beast. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. So you shall take every clean beast by sevens, the male and his female. Read on. And of the beasts that are not clean. Of the beasts that are not clean. By two, the male and his female. Two by two, the male and his female. Letting us know that there was a separation between clean and unclean beasts. So now if we go back to Genesis, the ninth chapter in the third verse, and it says that every living thing shall be meat for you. We know that that every is in reference to only clean beast. Can I add something as well? mm -hmm. If you notice here, like in Christianity, they'll teach us that the animals went in two by two. But when you read the Bible, the clean beast went in by sevens mm -hmm. and the unclean beast by two. Now, why is the most I sending in clean beast by sevens? because they would have to eat clean beasts on the other side of the flood. Mm -hmm. The unclean went in by two because nobody's going to eat that. Mm -hmm. Simple. Common sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to add that. Absolutely. So let's go to uh, Genesis 9, verse 4. Genesis 9, verse 4. So we see here that the sons of Noah had a dietary law. God. Right? Read on, verse 4. Verse 4. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Shall ye not eat. So the sons of Noah were commanded not to eat blood. Mm -hmm. Now, we know eventually this changed throughout the process of time. We're going to show you that change and show you how all of this connects with is your flesh your God. Mm -hmm. OK, but at first they had this commandment that you shall not eat blood. Read on. Verse five. Verse five. And surely your blood, and excuse me, and surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Mm -hmm. Verse four. 
Whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of the Most High, Most High God, made he man. Right. So right here, it's showing us what? A law of shedding blood or committing murder. Right? So they had a law amongst them that you would not shed any man's blood because that man's blood is required mm -hmm. at your hand or at the Most High. Okay? Read on. Verse 7. And you, be you fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Exactly. So what is this showing us? Be fruitful and multiply. There's only one way that you can become fruitful and multiply your seed. And that's a male relationship with a female relationship. So here the Most High is eliminating homosexuality, lesbianism, self-pleasure, bestiality, so on and so forth. Okay, the Most High is making it plain to all the sons of Noah that you're to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, anything outside of that is considered what? An abomination. Okay. Read on. Verse 8. And the Most High speak unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with you with your seed after you. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by waters of the flood. Mm -hmm. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 12. And the Most High said, This is the token of the covenant which I, have, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be before a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Right. So as a token of his covenant that he made with Noah and his three sons, the Most High set a bow, meaning a rainbow in the earth, as a confirmation that he would no longer destroy the earth by way of a flood. Today, when we see the rainbow symbol, we see it associated with what? the so-called LBGT community. Well, they stole that symbol from the Bible, which again was a symbol meant to solely give a sign or a token to the sons of Noah that he would not destroy the earth again by way of a flood, of course. Okay? So that's the original purpose of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. But of course, as the lesson states, or asked the question, is flesh your God? Those who have allowed their flesh to become their God, to take on unnatural affections, have now taken a righteous symbol of God and have turned it into an evil, wicked symbol. Okay, why? Because they have allowed their flesh to become their God, their ruler. Read on. You have something? No, no. Mm, read on. Verse 14. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. The bow shall be seen in the cloud. Read on. Verse 15. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between the Most High and, and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Mm -hmm. So all of the Most High's creation was protected within this covenant. Noah, his three sons, along with the creatures on the earth. Everyone was protected under this covenant, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's jump down to verse 18 and verse 19. Verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham, and Ham is the father of Canaan, mm -hmm. verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Now, of them was the whole earth overspread. Now, it makes mention in verse 18 that Ham is the father of Canaan, because we know that based on Ham's 
uh, impropriety or his sin against his father, his dishonor of his father, that a curse will be placed upon his son Canaan. Okay. Now, the key point I wanted to bring forward based on this is that we made a statement earlier. And that statement was that the Most High made this covenant with Noah and all of his sons. Okay. Now, not only did he make a covenant with them, also all the sons of Noah received commandments from the Most High. So now the question is, where did this go wrong? Or where did the sons of Noah go wrong? Where did they begin to deviate from this covenant? Not to commit murder, not to consume blood, not to eat clean animals. Not, in other words, where did they go wrong in following the commandments that the Most High gave unto them? Okay, let's try to get some insight from the Bible. Let's go over to the book of Genesis chapter 10. Mm -hmm. And let's read verse number nine. In fact, verse number eight. The book of Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Okay, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. And we went again last week in the academy. We touched on why he was referred to as a mighty hunter. Okay, read on, verse 9. Verse 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Most High. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Ahia, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. In the land of Shinar, okay? In other words, his kingdom began in the area known as Mesopotamia, what they call today the so-called Middle East, okay? Now, why are we bringing this up? Well, in the process of time, we know that the sons of Noah began to deviate from the covenant that was made with them by the Most High. And one of the chief ringleaders who came out of that rebellion was Nimrod. We know eventually in Genesis 11, built the Tower of Babel for the purpose of fighting against the Most High and overthrowing him. Okay, so Nimrod was used as Satan's tool or Satan's weapon or Satan's chosen son to rival the Most High's chosen. The question is, who was the Most High's chosen at this time? Well, the research, we find that the chosen lineage of the Most High at this time would come through Shem. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go over to the book of Genesis 11 and verse 10. And then also we'll get the book of Genesis chapter 14. Mm -hmm. Genesis 11 verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat Arphaxad, two years after the flood. Verse 11, and Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. and, Let's jump down to verse 14. So we're now seeing the lineage of Shem, read on. Verse 14, and Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And begat Eber. Eber is very important because he's one of the prominent sons of Shem who will be responsible as far as keeping not only the language, but also the culture of the Hebrew people. In fact, the word Hebrew itself goes back to the name Eber. Okay, let's go over to verse number 26. Verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Aran. Right, so he begot Abram, who was the exalted father. That's what Abram means. Why? Because of all the children of Shem, Abram was exalted to be the father of the covenant. Okay, so he is the exalted father and thus showing that through Shem would come the chosen lineage. Now let's get some more information on Shem, jumping over to the book of Genesis chapter 14 and verse number, uh, let's see here. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. The book of Genesis, chapter seven, um, 14, verse 17. And the king of Sa oh, excuse me, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of the Chedolomir, mm -hmm. and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaven, which is Kingsdale, mm -hmm. and Melchizedek. And Melchizedek 
Read on. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Who is this Melchizedek? Well, brothers and sisters, to research, we have found that this Melchizedek is Shem. Again, why am I going here? Well, I'm showing you that out of, even though the Most High made that covenant with all of the sons of Noah, eventually one of the sons of Noah would rise to, to prominence to be the son of promise or the heir of promise. And that child would be Shem. Now, the other sons of Noah, Japheth and Ham, if they wanted knowledge on how to serve the Most High God, they would have to go to who? To Shem. Okay? Because Shem, who was also known as Melchizedek, was a king and priest of the Most High. He understood the ways of how to serve the Most High. So the sons of Noah or the sons of Shem or, or the sons of Japheth and Ham, in order for them to receive that information, they would now have to go through Shem to learn how to serve God. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with your flesh becoming your God? Well, brothers and sisters, you're going to find out that a lot of what we what, what transpired, both pre-flood as well as post-flood, is an example of those who have made choices throughout history. And those choices, the majority of choices during that time period was people choosing, was people choosing to serve their flesh opposed to serving the will of the Most High. Okay, so eventually the, the sons of Japheth as a whole began to serve their flesh as their God. The children of Ham as a whole began to serve their flesh as their God. Some of the children of Shem began to serve their flesh as their God. So out of all of these sons, out of all of these nations, okay, let me go in there a little bit. Out of all of these nations, out of all of these sons of Shem, only a select few would choose to serve the Most High above their flesh. Okay? Now, we're going to read some examples of some of those sons of Shem, as well as others throughout the Bible, throughout, the, throughout history, who have chosen to serve the Most High above their flesh. And we're going to see what information, what records they have left behind to instruct us of future generation, generations on how to serve the Most High above our flesh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, perfect. perfect. It's better. All right. So before we go forward, let's read the um, <clears throat> let's read the uh, commentary. Okay. Uh, Atlantis and all the other so-called great pre-flood civilizations were utterly destroyed along with those who sided with the Nephilim and their perverse ways of living. We in our time are doing the same thing and have followed the so-called gods to a point of no return. Mm -hmm. Even the rainbow has been used as a sign of perversity when at the beginning it was a sign of the judgment of the past perversities and, and the promise of a judgment to come different than before, which would which would again destroy the wicked. Exactly, okay. And some people sometimes, when people hear us make mention of uh, fallen civilizations of the past, such as the one that they refer to as Atlantis, some people look at, the, look at us and say, well, isn't that a myth? Okay, isn't that mythology? Well, when you read the story of the flood, you read the book of Genesis, also when you read the book of Jasher and other records, okay? The book of Jasher, which is also mentioned in the Bible, all right? When you read these records and you compare it to the histories of so-called Atlantis and some of the past civilizations surrounding the time of the flood, you can almost, you can almost parallel the stories bit, piece by piece. Of course, some of the facts are gonna be different, because again, as we stated earlier, the Hebrews gave the perspective of the story from the Hebrew understanding, okay? The same way with the children of Japheth. They gave the story through a Japhetic mindset. Mm -hmm. The children of Ham gave it through a Hemetic mindset. But nonetheless, 
One thing that we can all agree to is that this event took place. Mm -hmm. All right. And when we come to that agreement and we look at some of these events and some of the things they mention, whether you consider it to be mythology, so on and so forth, we know that these things took place based on how they are recorded in scripture. Okay. In comparison to history. So let's, let's jump forward. Let's jump a bit further into history, biblical history, mm -hmm. dealing with the book of first Kings chapter 17, verse one. Mm -hmm. The book of first Kings chapter 17, verse one. And Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilgad, said unto her, Ahab, excuse me, as the most I self say of Israel live it before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Mm -hmm. Verse two. And the word of the most I came unto him saying, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Chirith that is before Jordan. Verse four. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Verse five. So he went and did according unto the word of the Most High. For he went and dwelt by the brook, Cherit, that is before Jordan. Verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and the bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Mm -hmm. So this time that we're reading of is the time of the prophet Elijah, was predominantly a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, Samaria at this time, namely, okay? Now, just to give a little bit of background history of the time of Elijah, because it was this was a great time of, it was a peril, this was a perilous time for the children of Israel, okay? Mainly they of the Northern Kingdom, based on the fact that our nation at this time period was in a great apostasy against the Most High. Now, during the time of Elijah, you had two predominant individuals whose names have become infamous throughout biblical history, and to some degree, even secular history. And that's Ahab and Jezebel, okay? Now we're gonna jump over to the book of uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, and you can read that down to the end, just to give us a little bit of background history of who was ruling during this time period. The book of 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. And Heab, the son of Ori, did evil in the sight. Excuse me, start again. And Heab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Most High, above all that were before him. Mm -hmm. Verse 31. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Etabahal. King, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Right. So they went and served Baal and worshipped him. So these were Baal worshippers. Ahab, who was an Israelite, and his wife, uh, Jezebel, who was a Zidonian, meaning she dwelt in the area of Tyre and Zidon, which is north of Samaria. Okay. And she brought forward Baal worship within the land of Israel. And of course, this was already established going back to the time of Jeroboam. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's jump down to uh, verse 32. Verse 32. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Verse 33. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Most High of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Mm -hmm. Verse 34. In this day did Ahiel, the, Beth, the Bethelite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Ab Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sig Sig Sigub, according to the word of the Most High, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Mm -hmm. Let's go to chapter 17 again, chapter 17, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Uh, the book of uh, second, First Kings, excuse me, chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, 
as the Most High God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Right. So again, this was a very troubling time for the nation of Israel, predominantly the northern kingdom. They were under Baal worship, and they had a king along with a woman, Jezebel, which the Bible details greatly the fact that she was used to destroy the prophets of the Most High. And eventually, one of those prophets that she tried to destroy was Elijah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this persecution of the prophets was so great that the prophets had to go into hiding. Right? Now, the key point we want to bring out is the fact that during this time period, there was a famine, or this time there was a drought. And later on in history, there was a famine. And this famine, I believe this was during the time of Elisha. This famine was so great that the people of Samaria began to eat and devour their own children. Okay? So, at this time, everyone had a choice. We see the choice, number one, dealing with Elijah and his choice to serve the Most High above his flesh. The Most High commanded him to go into a mountain and that he would be fed by ravens, both morning as well as evening, and that he would drink of the brook so that he could be nourished day by day. And you had others who instead of serving the Most High and trusting the Most High to bring upon them sustenance in due time, turning from their sin, turning from their Baal worship to serve the Most High so that he could care for them. Instead of doing so, many people turn to devouring and eating their own children. Okay? Now, some of us in this time period, we look at this and we say, well, how can someone do such a thing? Well, scientists and others have been able to uh, examine what takes place with someone when they go through starvation. Okay? And one thing they state is that if you're not if you've never gone through starvation, don't ever say what you won't do in the state when you're or facing a state of starvation. OK, because certain processes take place with your body that is so excruciating and so painful that you would rather try to eat anything in order to overcome that pain. And that's not saying that you should do so in such a case. What we're saying is that in such a case, in the case of famine, you should put your trust and your faith in the most high. Mm -hmm. Okay. But because these people did not put their, their, our forefathers didn't put their, their faith and their trust in the Most High, it left them to make decisions based on their flesh, not based on the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have something? Yes, sir. Read on. Um, when, in, when they started to eat their young, it was also prophesied as a, as a part of the curse mm -hmm. to do it. And they did it. They, Israel did it more than once. Israel did it at this time at the time of um, Elijah, and they also did it at the time of the siege of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. when, when um, Rome encompassed the city and nothing could come out, nothing com could come in, they started to eat the children. Mm -hmm. You can actually find that in uh, Josephus, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 56 to 57. Mm -hmm. It says, the tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil towards her husband of her bosom and towards her son and towards her daughter. Now, these are all the curses of Deuteronomy 28, verse 57. And towards her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them. Mm. It again. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. Mm. So it was a it was a curse put on um, our people also to to do to, to do that to eat their young. Mm. So Israel, you know, you need to be careful because the most high word isn't void. It can't go void. So if we get into a situation where we are we are without provisions, we could turn back to doing this again. Absolutely. It's not beyond us. It's it's it, it you know the most has, has set it upon us. All right, mm -hmm. just wanted to add that. Yep, and that's that's what they call human nature. But the reality is that we cannot rely on human nature. 
we have to rely on the spirit of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's read that. Let's read a little bit of that account and uh, the fulfillment of what you just read in Second Kings six and twenty eight. Mm -hmm. All right, and again, some people may ask, well, what does this have to do with us? Well, again, we are going to be faced with many choices in the future. Huh. Okay. The Bible, like you just mentioned, the most size word does not go back void. Mm -hmm. When the scriptures say that the things which were written aforetime were written for our learning, okay. that means exactly what it says. Meaning the things that were written in history, we would have to rely on for our decision making in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to explain also once a system, a particular system is put in place, many of us are going to be forced into a position where we were, we're, we're without provisions, we're without daily sustenance, and we will have to make a choice as to who we will serve. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's, let's show the fulfillment of what you just read, or one of the fulfillments of what Elder Dodger just read in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, and you're at verse 28, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 28, <clears throat> and the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat he eat him today, mm. and we will eat my son tomorrow. Right. So these women made an agreement amongst themselves. This was the destitute state that the northern kingdom and eventually the southern kingdom would fall into in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was the destitute, destitute state that they had fallen into. Two women came together and made an agreement amongst themselves to say, look. We're both starving. We both have children. This is what we'll do. Today, we will cook your child and eat your child. And tomorrow, we will cook and eat my child. Read on. Verse 29. So we boiled my son. So they, one part of the agreement was kept. One woman boiled her son. And did eat him. And did eat him. Read on. And I said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she said, and she had hid her son. And she have hid her son. So the other one didn't hold up to the agreement. Okay. Not that it makes her any more righteous because I'm pretty sure that she partook of that child that was boiled, that child that was cooked. Okay. Now I must address this because a lot of people think that because it's in the Bible, that the Bible is telling us to do what we're reading. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. One thing you're going to find out about the Bible and predominantly Israelite history is that the Bible documents the good, the bad, and the ugly of our history. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is this book, even though it's some may say it's a pro-Israelite book, book, it doesn't give us 100% of the time a good view of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. OK, it shows us the parts in our history where we went wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm mentioning this because you will have scoffers who will look at this and say, well, you ate your children in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the Bible does say we ate our children in wickedness mm -hmm. and that we're not to do such things. Mm -hmm. OK, others will look at it and say, well, it's in the Bible. That means I can do it. No, that's not what the Bible is stating. It's showing us a point in history of us apostatizing and turning our backs on the most high God in the state that we fell in because we turned our backs on God. Mm -hmm. And if we turn our backs on God again, you best believe that we will fall into that same exact state again. Simple and plain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is your flesh your God? We see in this, in this case, in this situation, these women allowed their flesh to take precedent to become their Lord and their God. Okay. Let's uh, move on to the next one. Okay. Let's go to Second Kings uh, 20 and 1. And again, some people may ask, well, hey, I, I don't have to worry about these things because I've made provisions, I've done this, I've done that, so on and so forth. Well, the Bible prophesies that a system will eventually be put in place called the Mark of the Beast system. And during the installation or the uh, that particular system being put in place, 
we all will have a choice to the point where the Bible says that uh, anyone who takes upon this mark and receives this mark will not be able to partake in the kingdom of the Most High. So basically, that's showing us that we have a choice either to serve the Most High God, our creator, or choose Satan as our God, choose Satan as our Lord and serve Satan for a season, but face the judgment of the Most High for eternity. You can, uh, you can leave it. Yep, that's good. Um, I think I'm dead for a moment. Uh, you yeah. need a glass. Give me a plastic one, yeah, please. Yeah, the water. Thank you, Adam. All right, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. The book of 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Most High, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Right. So now we're fast forwarding to another prophet. First, we dealt with the prophet Elijah. And we know that during Elijah's time that it was Ahab and Jezebel who ruled. Now we're moving forward to the time of Isaiah the prophet. The same one who is responsible for the book of Isaiah. And during his time period, we had King Hezekiah who ruled. And for the most part, King Hezekiah was what you would consider a good king for the most part. OK, but now the Most High had gave word unto Isaiah the prophet. To deliver unto Hezekiah. And that word was again. What was that again? Set thine house in order mm -hmm. for thou shalt die and not live. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. Verse two, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Most High, saying, I beseech thee, O Most High Power, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiah wept sore. Right, so Isaiah delivered him a message stating that you shall die and not live. What did Hezekiah do? Did Hezekiah say, well, I'm going to die anyway. Let me live out my last few days in lasciviousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. I only live once. Let me live out the rest of my days in drunkenness and fornication. Let me go gamble away all I have and let me, you know, deal with harlots and all types of things that people deal with when they come to a conclusion or they're told that you only have about this amount of time to live. Okay. And we see this with our people. Our people may have different sicknesses and ailments. The doctor's tell them you got three months to live. Well, mm -hmm. three months, okay. Let me use these last three months to deal in total evil and lasciviousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a, and a recent example of that that we can all talk about is our brother Azariah. They mm -hmm. told him he had two days. So, you know, mm -hmm. they've been gone in two days. Mm -hmm. So it goes to show you that they, they, they can't they can they can't dictate. Life or death. It's not that's not within their powers. Exactly. You know I mean? The power of life and death lies within the most high. Exactly. He, de he decides. Mm -hmm. And with that example, we show we we saw instead of the brother saying, Well, I'm gonna go anyway in two days. Mm -hmm. Okay, God forbid, of course that didn't happen. <laughs> the most high knew otherwise, right? But instead of the brother saying, I'm gonna be going in two days, let me just live the rest of my life in, in sorrow, mm -hmm. he said, Look. I want to live. And you know what Brother Azariah is doing right now? He's living. Mm -hmm. Okay? All praises to the Father. Right? So Hezekiah was faced with the same exact scenario. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking this last time or taking the time of his sickness to live in lasciviousness and evil, he decided to repent and turn to the Most High and pray. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 4. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of Ahiah came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Most High power of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Mm, the Most High said, I have heard thy prayer. Your prayer has made its way to my throne. Okay? And that's a powerful thing for the Most High to listen and hear and grant your prayers. Mm -hmm. Read on. I have seen thy tears. Mm. Behold, I will heal thee. Behold, I will heal thee. 
So initially, he was about to die. Mm -hmm. The issue of death was initially brought forward on the life of Hezekiah. But Hezekiah turned to the Most High and repented, and the Most High turned back the issue of death, which was initially sent forward upon his life. Okay? So when Isaiah brought that message, Isaiah wasn't lying. Isaiah was telling the truth according to what was revealed to him by the Most High. Mm -hmm. But because of repentance, true repentance, weeping, okay, praying, okay, without ceasing, the Most High heard the prayer of Hezekiah, and he, he turned back that issue of death. Okay? Hezekiah, you will live. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verses, let me pick up again from uh, uh, the rest of verse five on the third day. I have I have seen thy thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the most high. And the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Excuse me. Now, of course, we know that this is a a, a, a prophetic thing that we're seeing here with Hezekiah with the third day. We know that Christ prophesied that what? He will destroy this temple and rebuild it on the third day. So all throughout the Old Testament, it gives us messages and insight of this coming Messiah, this coming prophet, and the, the things that he would fulfill of God's word, of God's law, of God's prophecies. Okay, read on. Verse 6, and I will add unto thy days 15 years. And I will add unto thy days 15 years. So initially... Hezekiah was on his way out, but again, through his repentance, his sorrow of heart, his praying without ceasing, the Most High granted him another 15 years of life. Mm -hmm. Read on. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I, not only will I give you 15 years of life, I will deliver you and your city out of the hands of the king of Assyria. Okay, read on. And I will defend the city for mine own sake and for my, and for my servant David's sake. And for my servant David's sake. So for David's sake, the promise that I made with David that there shall not want a son to sit upon his throne. And we know if, uh, eventually Christ was that son who would come through David's loins, who would come through Hezekiah's loins, who would sit eventually upon the throne of Judah, who the Most High was foreseeing. And because he foresaw Christ, he did not allow anything to happen to Hezekiah at this time period. Mm -hmm. Okay. For David, my servant's sake. Verse 7. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. Take a lump of figs. Read on. And they took and laid it upon the boil, mm -hmm. and he recovered. Right. So the prophet Isaiah was given instruction of the Most High to deal with what? A natural remedy. remedy. Medicine. Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't say go unto the witch of Endor or go to this prophetess or, or go to this uh, sorcerer, this wizard mm -hmm. to get a potion to give unto Hezekiah. He said, just use what you have of the earth. Use the figs. There's healing qualities to the water. Yeah. <clears throat> There's healing qualities within the natural things that the Most High created in the earth. Okay. So all through this process that we're seeing with Hezekiah, we're seeing a perfect example of someone who trusted in the Most High, opposed to trusting in their own flesh, their own mind, their own wisdom, their own will. Mm -hmm. and, and also, it's not the Most High healing is not magic. Mm. You, the Most High is, is it, you know, listen, the healing is going to come, you're going to get some, some, some remedies and use it. Mm. So it's like, it's like, you know, just one just came to me. We have a lifestyle, you know, we 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 cancer, but we don't want to change that lifestyle mm. and start to change the, the, the eating habits, you know. So we have to, it's not magic. You have to, you have to, you, you know, it's not blind faith. You have to do, it's tangible, it's 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 evidence. You understand? So exactly. And I'm glad you brought that out. Um let's let's go real quickly, let's deviate a little bit and go to the book of Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. uh, 38 mm -hmm. and uh verse number uh one. Mm -hmm. 
the book of Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, in the Apocrypha, chapter 38, verse 1. Honor a physician with the honor unto him for the uses which he may have of him. Let me read it again. Honor a physician with the honor due unto him for the uses which you may have of him. Right. So the Bible says, honor a physician with the honor due unto him. So there is an honor that is due unto a physician. And of course, it's going to tell you the type of physician it's talking about. Okay. It's mm -hmm. not talking about the wizards we have today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the sorcerers we have operating today. It's talking about true physicians who operate according to the spirit and wisdom of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Read on. For the Most High had come at, excuse me, I'm going to finish it off verse one. For the Most High had created it. For the Most High had created him. So, yes, the Most High had created physicians. Read on. For of the Most High cometh healing, and he shall receive honor of the king. Right. So, of the Most High cometh healing, and he shall mm -hmm. receive honor of the king. Mm -hmm. You notice any great and wise king within his court had what? Wise and great physicians. Okay? Why? Because healing cometh from the Most High. And the person who is instructed in the Most High's healing is what? The physician. Mm -hmm. Read on. The skill of the physician shall lift up his head, and in the sight of great men he shall be in admiration. And in the sight of great men he shall be in admiration. Mm -hmm. They will admire this man. Okay? Read on. Why? Because he is responsible under the power of the Most High for keep, keeping the king healthy and strong before the people. So through that, the physician is well admired. Read on. Verse 4. The Most High had created medicines out of the earth. So the Most High created medicines out of the earth. So yes, the Bible does speak about medicine. Okay, mm -hmm. but the medicines that the Bible deals with are medicines that come naturally from the earth. Now, one thing about this world's medicines is that some of these things do come from the earth, but it's the processes and the, the synthesizing and all the things they go through before they reach you. Mm -hmm. So they may take some rosemary, they may take some lemon and take certain herbs from the earth, which are known to heal. And what they'll do is they'll create a synthetic version instead of giving it giving it to you in its whole form okay mm -hmm. they'll take a little bit of something from here and a little bit of something from there and concoct it into one little thing and it may help with a certain side effect but that side effect because it does not provide true healing will give rise to another side effect mm -hmm. which will be treated and will give rise to another side effect mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. That's not the type of physician that the Most High has set in this earth for the purpose of healing. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Bible is going to tell us about the physician and also it's going to tell us about the process of getting healed. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Let's start the verse 4 again. Mm -hmm. The Most High had created medicines out of the earth, and he that is wise will not abhor them. Verse 5. Was not the water made sweet with wood, mm. and the virtue thereof might be known? Mm. And he had given men skill that he might be honored in his marvelous works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With such doeth he heal men and take it away their pain. So he does what? With such doeth he heal men and take it away their pain. He treats the side effects. With, with such do it he heal men and take it away their pain. No, nah, he gives you something for the headache, which now gives you heart problems. With such do it he heal men and take it away their pain. No, nah, he gives you something for your heart problems, which now gives you kidney problems. With such do it he heal men and take away their pain. So with such do it he heal men, not treat their side effects. He heals them and he takes away their pain. That is a true physician. Okay. Read on. Of such doth the apothecary make a, a confession, and of his works there is no end, and from him is, is peace over all the earth. My son, in thy sickness be not negligent. So in thy sickness be not negligent. But pray unto the Most High, and he will make thee whole. But pray unto the Most High, and he will make thee whole. Now, why am I going here? Well, we saw what we're reading here with the king Hezekiah. Before he received the remedy, before he received the boil fix for his or the fix for his boil, 
he first went and prayed to the Most High. And the Most High confirmed within him that he would be healed and that healing would allow him to live for another 15 years. He received that confirmation from the Most High first before he received the remedy. After he received the confirmation, he went, he got the remedies. And with those remedies, you know, as you mentioned, with that comes what? Lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Read on. Verse 10. Leave off from sin. Leave off from sin because, yes, sin contributes to sickness. Mm -hmm. Sin contributes to illness. Okay. And sometimes people try to make it this, uh, what do they call it? This spooky kind of thing. Like it's just, uh, they, they try to mystify it in a way where it's, it's like uh, you do something wrong and the most High is going to strike you, or put his finger on you and make you sick. Now, those things are mentioned in the Bible where someone is just struck with sickness. OK, but some of the sickness that comes upon us is very practical. The Bible says that you shall not be a drunkard, that you shall drink in moderation. Mm -hmm. So if you go against that, what happens if you go against drinking in moderation? What will happen? Your body will start to deteriorate. OK, liver damage, mm -hmm. kidney damage. Why? Because the most high your creator who created your body knows exactly how your body is supposed to work and what is good for your body. Mm -hmm. So when you go against his instruction for your body, what happens? You get sick. OK, he says abstain from fornication. If you don't do so, if you think that's in your best interest, that you only live once and you're going to do this thing a, a million times with a million different people, what happens? You destroy your body. You get sicknesses. You get illnesses. You get STDs. Very practical. And this leads into the lesson. Is your flesh your God? It still links. Are we serving our flesh? Or are we going to serve, serve, serve the most time spirit and in truth? It's simple. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's one or the other. Exactly. In fact, we, we're going to get that, all, that scripture which makes mention of that that there's only two masters and to whoever, whomever you give your flesh to serve or whoever you give yourself over to serve, that particular thing is your master. Okay, let's finish out here in uh, Sirach and then we're gonna get those two references mm -hmm. and we're gonna jump back into the, the, the lesson. Mm -hmm. Verse 10, I'll read verse 10 again. Mm -hmm. Leave off from sin mm -hmm. and order thy hands aright mm -hmm. and cleanse thy heart from all wickedness. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, give a sweet savor, a memorial of fine flour, and make a fat offering as not being. Right. Now, in the Old Testament, when the Most High healed us, we would go and offer a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you don't necessarily have to offer a sacrifice in this time. Christ is the sacrifice. But if you want to celebrate the Most High giving you healing, mm -hmm. you want to throw a little barbecue with the family, go ahead and do so. Praise the Most High for healing you. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's one more thing. Uh, verse 12. And we're going to finish this up. Verse here. 12. Then give place to the physician. Then give place to the physician. Read on. So the Most High, that the, for the Most High had created him. Let him not go from thee, for thou hast need of him. Let him not go from thee, for thou hast need, need of him. So go to the Most High first, and then you go to the physician, just like Hezekiah did. Okay, he went to the Most High, then he got the help from the physicians. Now let's go to um, uh, those two verses, uh, God and Mammon, and then Romans 6. I think that's Matt, was that Matthew 6 and 24? Mm -hmm. Let me get Roman, um, Romans 6 verse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Romans 6, the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses, let me start at 18. Being then made free from sin. In you, fact, start in verse 16. Verse 16. Book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 16. In fact, let's, let's go up. This is uh, such a good, this whole chapter is good when you get the opportunity, when you're dealing with uh, who you serve, how who you serve becomes your God. Mm -hmm. This is the perfect chapter for that topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to get straight to the point. Um, let's go. Let's go to verse number twelve. Okay. Romans verse um, chapter six verse twelve. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Right. Now, notice it uses the word reign in reference to sin. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Now, 
usually when we think of reigning, we think of rulership, we think of a king, we think of a lord. Mm -hmm. So in other words, let not sin become the Lord or the king over your body, that you shall obey the lust or that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Mm -hmm. Because the same way you would obey your Lord, your king or your ruler, if you allow sin to become or take the precedent of your life, you begin to serve sin as your Lord, your king and your ruler. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, mm -hmm. but yield yourself unto a higher, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto the Most High. Mm -hmm. And when that word instruments is used, that word instrument means a weapon. Okay? Use not your flesh or yield not your members as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Right. Read on. And just to add, I mean, you know, be careful of the things that you look at, mm. the things you 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 hear, mm. what you speak. These are your instruments, mm. because what you see, you know, what you see, plant seed. What you hear, plant seed, and what comes out of your mouth, the file of a man. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me go here, verse fourteen. Mm -hmm. For sin shall uh, not have dominion over For you. For sin shall not have dominion or reign or lordship over you. Mm -hmm. Okay. This should not be the first thing you seek. From the time you get up in the morning, how can I obey the lust of my flesh? Through the whole day until the time you go to bed, you're finding ways mm -hmm. to obey the lust of your flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's very simple, very practical. This is not a, a mystical understanding that we're bringing forward. This is very practical. Mm -hmm. Okay? If fornication and uncleanness, if that's on your mind from the time you get up, and to the time you go to sleep, then understand that you're yielding your members as servants mm -hmm. of unrighteousness. Huh. OK, it's very simple because because and I have to make that clear, because some people think that in order for this to be the case, you have to be in the satanic church on the altar, mm -hmm. you know, worshiping the Baphomet. Mm -hmm. No, nah, that's <laughs> that's that's like the top level of 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 doing this. OK, but on the low level. Just disobeying the Most High's commandments, you're showing who your Lord and your God is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 14 again. Reading from the Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Right. So you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, we can clear that up as we go along, but mm -hmm. we're going to stick here with this, this concept that we're dealing with. Okay? Because we are under grace grace. How mm -hmm. do we know this? Well, the Bible tells us that we've all done things that are worthy of death. Mm -hmm. So based on that, all of us should be dead by now. But because we're under grace and not under the law, we're not dead. In fact, many of us have repented. We've come back and served the Most High in spirit and in truth. And we're trying to keep our way on this, this path, this beaten path, until the Most High brings the kingdom. Okay? That, that can only be possible through grace. Mm -hmm. Right? Read on. What then? Shall we, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Right. So now shall you abuse the grace of the Most High? Shall you now say that because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, I shall now sin willfully? Mm -hmm. Read on. God forbid. God forbid, meaning no. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 16. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, mm -hmm. whether are whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Right. So to whom whomsoever you yield yourselves to obey, that thing becomes your master. Okay. So if you do everything for the love of money. For the love of the dollar dollar bill, then the dollar dollar bill is your God. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because I saw a video of what I saw one of these dudes from the conscious community actually praying to money. You wow. with me? So what, what he was doing all along was for, for, for money. You get me? That's that's who we serve. That's, you with me? It's not it's not about uplifting the people. It's not about exactly. it's not about um edifying anybody, it's about money. Mm -hmm. That's what you yield yourself to. You understand? Mm. Us in us in the truth right now, you know. I come, we we come into the truth, and we have cha we change our lives. Mm. You with me? It was never. It's not about 
what we could what we can ascertain it's about you know our soul salvation our change that that being born again being renewed exactly you with me so that you know that, that that's who we serve mm. that's our master exactly but yeah exactly so that brother, who, whoever that was, I've never seen that video. I'm sure it's yes. <laughs> Whoever was praying to that money, that money is his God. Yeah. Okay? And that money who is his God will not save him in the time of trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay? It will not save you in the time of trouble. Mm -hmm. All right? If you serve your flesh, if you're all about the fornication, I only live once. Okay? Let me do as I will. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you operate in that, then your flesh is your God. Fornication is your God. Mm -hmm. And that God will not save you in the time of trouble. Okay? So whoever you, you turn your, your members to, or you yield your members to, or you give authority over your members, mm -hmm. that thing becomes your Lord and your God. Mm -hmm. And I would say Savior, but that would be impossible because those things cannot save you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Do you have anything else? Um, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6 verses 24 no man can serve two masters no man can serve two masters I don't care who they are and I remember um, this was a long time ago uh, maybe about 20 years ago I remember uh, P. Diddy Pup Daddy whatever he calls himself these days uh, he made the statement that the meek shall inherit the earth. But that doesn't mean that you have to be meek all the time. Something along those lines. OK, so in other words, you have you can play the middle field on meekness. And this is how people think. OK, let me play the middle ground or the gray area when it comes to the most size commandments and what he expects from us. OK, let me be evil all week. But on Sunday. I'm the most righteous, most holiest thing on earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? And for us who know the truth, I may be evil all week, but on the Sabbath, I'm the most holiest, most righteous thing on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Amongst Muslims, evil and wicked all through the week, but come Friday, they're in, they're, in, uh, they're in the mosque. Exactly. And everything's good again. Exactly. And so the Catholics are going through this um, confession business, wicked all you want, but then you go confess them and you're good again. Exactly. Crazy. That's the, the most I don't deal with that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> just wanted to on what you said about being wicked mm -hmm. and then thinking you have some something you know whether it's daily weekly or whatever to absolve you from that mm. that's that's where what, what was the verse verse 15 romans 5 and 16 mm -hmm. what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace mm -hmm. right mm-hmm under the law of sacrifice. Right. Exactly. Because they knew, like the Catholics, like the right. Muslims, that, okay, I've done this. And there's even stories, right, in the Bible, yeah. where they would prepare, they would go get the sacrifice. Right. For sin. the sin. Then sin. Right. And then they've got the sacrifice ready to cover the sin. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're not under that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a, that's a very key point. And that's, we're going to bring that out as far as that law that it's speaking about is the, the law, law of sacrifice. sacrifice. Exactly. And that's very important because a lot of people now think when it says we're not under the law means that we, we're not responsible for keeping any commandments. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're not under the law of sacrifice places us under greater scrutiny than before. Because in the old covenant, if I committed a sin which was not worthy unto death, mm -hmm. I could go and offer a sacrifice and be absolved, absolved mm -hmm. according to the law. Mm -hmm. But under Christ, that does not exist. You must get it right and get it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? You have something? After you get that, let's get Hebrews 10 and 26. Mm -hmm. uh, Revelations. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelations 20 and 12. And, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the Most High, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Mm. So mm. works is your action. Mm -hmm. So judgment comes based on what you've been doing. So this law, when it says you're not under the law, is the law of sacrifice mm. unto sin and death. So that's all that is. So the, you have work, there's things that you're going to be judged on based on what you've been doing in life, which mm -hmm. is which is which is law. You know the law. The law determines what was right and what was wrong. Mm -hmm. So there is a law. 
Exactly. Just want to drop that there. Yep. Say Hebrews, um, Hebrews 10 and 26. And then we're going to jump back to Matthew 6 and then we're going to get back into the information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hebrews 10 verses 26. Mm -hmm. And it reads, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. For if we have we've sinned willfully, after having received the knowledge of the truth, meaning you know what is right according to the Most High's commandments, but yet you continue to break that commandment willfully. Read on. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice of sins. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? There is no more sacrifices that you can go and offer for an act to, to absolve you of your sins. Mm -hmm. And definitely Christ is not coming back to the earth to die for your sins. Okay, there's a little bit more there. So have it. Uh, Matthew or Hebrews 10 and 27. Okay, so there's no more sacrifice for sins. It tells us in the book of Romans 9 and 28 that Christ came into the earth once to die for sin. And the second time he's coming is for the judgment of this world. He's not coming back again as a sacrifice for our sins. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 27. Mm -hmm. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment. This is what you can expect if you sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Read on. And fiery indignation. And fiery indignation. Read on. Which shall devour the adversaries. Which shall devour the adversaries. Read on. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. <clears throat> Under two or three witnesses. Right. So under Moses' law, a person was convicted of sin if there were two or three witnesses who can validate that this person committed sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now let's see how this works under Christ. Read on. Verse 29. Of how much sorrow punishment. How much sorrow punishment? Well, hold up. I thought under Christ, the punishment was lighter. Mm-hmm. Read that again. Of how much sore punishment. How much sore punishment, not lighter punishment, but sore punishment. Read on. Suppose you shall he be taught word, worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of the Most High. Who have trodden underfoot the Son of the Most High. Now it's showing us what the Most High thinks when we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of repentance, the knowledge of God's commandments. This is how the Most High looks at you. You're like one who have done what? Despised who? This, this, let me start, let me start over again. Mm -hmm. yep. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of the Most High? Who had trodden underfoot the Son of God. This is how the Most High thinks of you. Read on. And I counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And you count the blood of the covenant through which we were washed through baptism as an unholy thing. Read on. And have done despite unto the spirit of grace. And have done despite unto the spirit of grace. This is what happens, or this is how the Most High views you when you break his commandments willfully under grace. It's like you have despised the spirit of his grace. You have rendered him underfoot. Or you have rendered his mercy underfoot. Read on. Verse 30, for we know him that had said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Most High, and again, the Most High shall judge his people. Mm -hmm. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living power. Right, so that's the context of it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How do you fall into his hands? By becoming an enemy. How do you become an enemy of God? By sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Now he must take vengeance on you. No different than he will take vengeance on the nations. Okay. And this is why when we instruct, instruct brothers and sisters. I know a lot of times we get carried away into what's going to happen to the nations. We're going to judge this one. We're going to cut this one up and do this and that in the third. If we don't comply to the covenant that the Most High have given us through Christ. Then we will be on the receiving end of Christ's sword. Simple and plain. Okay, read on, or uh, you can go to uh, Matthew six and twenty-four. The book of uh, Saint Matthew, chapter six, verse twenty-four: No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. So you're going to either hate one master or love the other. There is no middle ground with the Most High. There is no gray area. Either your works 
are serving the Most High or your works are serving Satan. Simple and plain. We are, so this is how we make, this is how we, uh, this is how we conceptualize this and bring this on a practical level so that we can understand it, okay? With any action that goes forward, just ask yourself, okay, is this action of the Most High or is this action or is the fruit of this action serving the Most High or is the fruit of this action towards serving Satan, okay? And when I say that, I don't mean, okay, when I turn on the TV, let me ask, is this the Most High that I'm turning on the TV or is this Satan? Uh, is this Satan that I'm turning my car on or is this the most high? I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about when it comes to decisions, okay? Spiritual decisions, daily decisions, you have to ask yourself, is this of the work of the most high or is this the work of Satan, okay? Uh, you, you finished with that? No, or is that okay. is more there. Go ahead. For either he will hate the one and love the other. So either you will hate the one or love the other. So either you hate Satan and love the Most High, or you love Satan and hate the Most High. Or, Simple and plain. Read on. Or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Mm -hmm. Yet you cannot serve God and Mammon. Mm -hmm. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take not thought for your life. For what you shall eat or what you shall drink, mm -hmm. nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Mm -hmm. Is not the life more than the meat and the body more than raiment? You see that? So now the now Christ has given us instruction. Uh, remember that Christ tells us in Matthew 5 and 17 that think not is, is 5 and 7 or 5 and 17. 5 and 17. So Matthew 5 and 17 says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Again, many, many people read that and they get confused and think, well, Christ came and fulfilled the law, so I don't have to keep the commandments. No, through Christ fulfilling the law, he showed us a new and better way on how to keep the commandments of God. OK, so now he's given us instruction in the book of Matthew six, how to pray, how to give alms. OK, how to serve one master. How not to be worldful, how to have faith in the Most High God, how to serve God opposed to your flesh. Think not what I shall put on for raiment. Think not what I shall eat. Why? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not. For the fowls of the air sow not, meaning there is no sewing shop in this earth where you got birds in front of sewing machines putting together garments. But what? Neither do they reap. Neither do they reap. In fact, let me correct that. When it says so, uh, that means uh, planting seeds, mm -hmm. salakia. There's one that makes mention of toiling, mm -hmm. of the grass toiling, salakia. So the birds do not sow seeds and they do not reap harvest, but yet. Nor gather into bonds, mm -hmm. yet your heavenly father feed at them. Are you not much better than they? Are you much better than the fowls of the air? Did not the Most High make you the center of all the creatures that he created, made you on the sixth day and gave you rain and gave you rulership over all the creatures of the earth, including the fowl? Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 27. Which of you, by, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Verse 22. So, in other words, it's good to say, what are you worrying for? Because you can sit there and worry all day and not change anything. Exactly. You can be sitting there all day on your mind. Okay, I want to grow another inch or add another, you know, let me add a centimeter to my height. And you can meditate on that all day. You can worry all day. You can think about it all day and you will not change anything. Okay. So the Bible says, take no thought because your thoughts can't change anything. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're not going to take action. Now, when I say take action, I'm not talking about fleshly action because you have people who will sit there and meditate on what will I wear? What will I eat? What will I drink? And the action that precedes that is what? Or the action that comes after that is what? Well, I don't know where my food is going to come from, so I'm going to steal so I can eat. I don't know where my clothing is going to come from, so I'm going to steal to get clothing. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm not talking about those actions. The action that should go forward, if those are your worries, the first thing you should do is get on your knees and pray. Okay? Read on. Verse 28. And why take you thought of for raiment, 
Consider the lilies of the field, mm -hmm. how they grow. <clears throat> they toil not. They toil not. No, that's talking about sewing, mm -hmm. okay? Putting together garments. So flowers are not setting up sewing shops, mm -hmm. okay? There's no Levi sewing shop or what do they call them? Sweatshop full of lilies, mm -hmm. okay? There's no, what's the other one? There's no Old Navy shop where you got lilies posted up in front of sewing machines, creating garments, creating jeans, creating jackets, so on and so forth. But the Bible tells us that the lily, lilies are what? Lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not. Neither do they spin. Mm -hmm. Verse 29. Mm -hmm. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory. Even Solomon in all of his glory, in all of his kingdom, and Solomon was beautifully decked in his glory. But what? Was not arrayed like one of these. They were not. He was not arrayed like one of the lilies of the field. Read on. Verse 30. Wherefore, if the most high so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Mm. O you little, oh you of little faith. O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. And that little faith, reflecting back to what we read earlier, that little faith is what led those women to making that agreement to consume each other's children. Instead of going to the father, putting away their idols, putting away the Baal and all that other stuff that they were worshiping, instead of the Mosai, they said, look, we're gonna to continue to be evil worshiping Baal, but I tell you what, we, we have found a way, or we can come up with a way in which we can fulfill our flesh for a moment. Today, you cook your child, and tomorrow, we'll cook my child. Mm -hmm. OK, that's an example of one operating in little faith. OK, and notice that the Bible, uh, this scripture is almost becoming a mantra <laughs> these days, because um, oftentimes when, when, when things are brought forth, uh, uh, usually the first response that our people are used to giving is excuses. OK, and to some degree, we can all fall, all, we can all fall victim to giving excuses. Mm -hmm. OK. But the Bible tells us, this is the beauty of the Mosai's work, okay? It puts everything in perspective, regardless of who we are, what we are, what we think, how we feel, or what have you, okay? The scriptures tell us in the book of Sirach that a wicked man will not be reproved, but findeth an excuse according to his way, okay? Usually, when, we, when it's addressed, or when our sin is addressed, Instead of us owning up to the sin, we do what? We find an excuse. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we couldn't find any food here. We couldn't find anything here. So we thought it would be best for us to consume our children. That's me. That, that becomes the excuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well, you know, there was no food in the fridge, no food in the house. I didn't have any clothes on my back. My shoes are run down. So I went and stole. Or I went and sold drugs. I'm just trying to put food on the table. And feed my daughter. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. anytime you hear that a drug deal. I'm trying to feed my daughter. Mm -hmm. Just know you're dealing with a wicked individual, because you're trying to feed your daughter, but in the process you're taking food out of the mouths of how many other daughters? Mm -hmm. How many other sons are being destroyed because of the drug and the poison that you're putting on the street? Mm -hmm. That's taking food out of their mouths because mm -hmm. their mothers are taking their money, and instead of getting food, they're getting your poison. Mm -hmm. OK, but again, this is an example of how our people deal with excuses. OK, a wicked man. Remember the scripture, a wicked man will not be reproved, but find it an excuse according to his way. You're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Let's get that real quick. Is it 32 and 17? Yes, the book of Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 32, verse 17. A sinful man will not be reproved. A sinful man will not be reproved, meaning a sinful man will not be corrected. Mm -hmm. But find an excuse according to his will. Well, I'm just trying to feed my daughter. I'm trying to, you know, put food on the table. I'm trying to keep a roof over the head. So you steal, you lie, you kill, you sell drugs, you sell dope, you prostitute. Mm -hmm. Okay? O ye of little faith, is what the Most High says. Okay, oh ye of little faith. You mean to tell me you have to steal? And I, the most I got food all over this earth. Okay, 
The Most High has sustenance all over this earth. There's things out there right now that you don't even know is food. If you looked into it, you would find that that thing can give you sustenance. Mm -hmm. But yet you resort to your flesh instead of relying on the Most High and what he gave us in this earth to sustain ourselves. Okay, what's wrong with doing honest things to sustain yourself? O ye of little faith. Okay. But again, when our flesh becomes our God, we begin to make those excuses, understanding that, okay, if you were just trying to feed your daughter, I mean, you probably could have fed your daughter with the first hundred thousand dollars that you made from drug dealing or the first 50,000, whatever amount of money you made, you could have fed your daughter with that and kept it moving. Mm -hmm. Not condoning it, but if that's the objective of you selling your drugs, you could have been done at 30,000, 50,000, 100,000, a million. But yet you get that money and you keep going. Why? Because that thing have now become your God. You now have served that thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That should, you can't go to sleep without thinking a new way you can scheme and come up with money and destroy your people in the process. Okay. So the question is, is your flesh your God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back into the lesson. You have anything else before we continue? No, that's it. All right. Um, <clears throat> Let's go to the book of Job, uh, the 33rd chapter, the 14th verse. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're, we're going to we're, we're coming to a close. There's a lot more we can cover, but we're going to cover a few more points. And then we're going to go into question and answer. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, Job 33 and 14, uh, 33 and 14. The book of Job, chapter 33, verse 14. For the most I speak at once, you twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Right. So the most I speak at once, yea, twice, and man perceiveth it not, meaning the Most High communicates with us all the time, mm -hmm. but yet we don't perceive it. Why? Because we're not listening. Why? Because we're so consumed with how we can fulfill the flesh. Mm -hmm. Most High is trying to speak with you, and the only thing on your mind is whisper dinner. Mm -hmm. Not to say it's, it's, it's wrong to plan for whisper dinner, but hey, the Most High is trying to communicate. Okay? The Most High is trying to communicate, and you, you're the only thing on your mind, okay, how am I going to pay this bill? Mm -hmm. Well, if you open up and you listen to the Most High, he can show you how you're going to pay that bill. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you have to listen. Right? Read on. Verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed. Right. So now it's showing how the Most High communicates with men predominantly. In a vision, in a dream, in a vision by night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in the slumberings upon the bed. Meaning that this is how the Most High, this is one of the predominant ways that the Most High communicates with mankind while they're sleeping. Read on. Verse 16. Then he opened the ears of men and sealed their instructions. So while you sleep, the Most High openeth up, open up your ears and he sealeth your instruction. Read on. Verse 17. That he may withdraw men from his purpose and hide Pride from man. Right, so that he may withdraw you from your purpose and hide pride from man. Because there's a lot of things that you think that you're going to do the next day before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. you got a whole lot of plans of what you're going to do the next day. Okay? But the Most High, through his mercy, through his grace, seals instruction within us, and it takes us in a total, totally different direction. Mm -hmm. Let's get that real quick in the book of, um, I believe it's James, the fourth chapter. Where it speaks about that, uh, someone saying what they're going to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, James 4. Or James 3 and 13. Let's try that. If, if not, 4 and 13. I think it's 4 and 13. 4 and 13. Let's read that. Mm hmm. That's it. Yes, one thirteen. The book of James, chapter four, verse thirteen. Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Right. So this is speaking about those who say today or tomorrow they're going to do such and such and so and so. Okay. Read on. Verse fourteen. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. Right, so you're making these plans not understanding what tomorrow holds. Now is the Bible saying not to be, um, not to plan ahead or so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. That's not what the Bible is saying. 
Okay. And may, I, may I just add something? Yep, go ahead. And it's more, it's more speaking into planning on the flesh. Mm -hmm, exactly. So if you're planning, if you're sowing things on the flesh, okay, it's in, and, and, and it says this here. It says, go to now, you that say tomorrow or, to, sorry, sorry, excuse me, say today or to tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Mm. So speaking about gains, mm. so you're making plans for gains. Mm. A lot of us get up every day and our plans are, okay, what am I going to sow into the flesh? Mm. The plans aren't, what am I going to do for the most I? Or what does the most I want me to do? What's my purpose here? We, I think that was one of the first scriptures that we, um, the, in, in, in the introduction, we read it to the lesson about mm. purpose. Right. What's the purpose? Because sometimes we think that our purpose is is flesh, mm. but then the most I have another purpose for us. That is, you know, the whole conclusion of the matter is keeping his laws and fearing him. Mm. And we have that we have that purpose to show that to, to others, to bring that up. So if our if our thing is to buy self again for gain for a year, then the more, you know, that's not not the most I's plan. Mm. You understand? Because as 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 um the Messiah said earlier that listen. Don't take no, no thought for food or raiment. The most I will deal with you. Or you have little faith. Mm. You know, so it, it boils back into that. We'll get up and we'll make plans according to the you know, fleshly plans, worldly plans. But this is according to what the most I doing. And it goes back. All of these precepts bowl in with a lesson. Exactly. Who are you serving? Are you serving your flesh? Is your flesh your God? Mm. Are you serving the most I in spirit and in truth? Right. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to bring that. Yep. In it. And let's read verse 14 because it's going to build and elaborate upon what was just stated as far as the, the plan, the preemptive planning that it's speaking of. Again, it's nothing wrong with being preemptive and, and putting things in place mm -hmm. for plans, but even within your planning, mm -hmm. understand that the most high spirit moveth wherever it listeth. Mm -hmm. Okay. You may think that that's what you're going to do a week from or within this next week, mm -hmm. but the most high spirit can move you in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's read verse 14. Verse 14. Whereas you know not what you shall be on the morrow, mm. for what is your life? For what is your life? Read on. It is even a vapor. It is even a vapor. That, read on. That appear it for a little time and then vanish it away. Mm. Verse 15. For that you ought to say, if the most I will, we shall live and do this or that. Right. So before you do anything, you say what? If it be the most high's will, mm -hmm. we will do this. And do that. Okay. And you notice anytime we mention anything, we say, listen, it'd be the most high as well. Because we know we didn't plan things, we didn't thought that we we're gonna do this and that, and the most high takes it in a different direction. Okay. That's how that's how we're to operate in the earth. Now, going back to the book of Job, uh, the 33rd chapter, let's go back there, mm -hmm. Job 33, where it says he keepeth back his soul from the pit. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what we think we're gonna do the next day. Is going to lead us into a, a pit. It's going to lead us to death. So the most high throws a monkey rich in, the, in your scheme through your dreams, through your actions. He may even put a sickness on you to have you in the bed all day just so that you don't move and go down to that pit. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's going, to, it's going to mention that as we read in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 18. He keeps it back its soul, his soul from the pit. And his life from the perishing of the sword. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. You see that? He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. Most high may do certain things or allow something to happen so that you, you're held still against your own will. Because he knows that on the other side of what you think you're going to do may be danger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Read on. And the multitude of his bones with strong pain. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. So that his life abhorred bread and his soul dainty meat. Mm. His flesh is consumed away mm. that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Verse 22. Yea, his soul draw it near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. Right. So you're brought to near death through pain and through ailments. Okay, is what Job is saying. Verse number 23. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. Verse 24. Then he is gracious unto him. Then he is gracious unto him. Go ahead. And say it. Deliver him from going down to the pit 
I have found a ransom. Right. Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. So now the Most High restores you. Read on. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Right. So he can remove that sickness from off you and make you whole. Heal you fully. Okay. So it's your return to the days of your youth. And we see that sometimes when brothers and sisters are healed through the spirit of the Most High. They're going through ailments. They're going through sicknesses. You tell them, listen, go before the Most High, pray. We get a herbalist on the line or someone who can help them make the necessary lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. And that person says, well, look, after adopting, adopting this, I'm feeling so good right now. And I haven't felt this well since I was about 30. Mm -hmm. I haven't felt this well since I was 25, since mm -hmm. I was in my teens. These, these are the confessions that people make when the Most High restores them to good health. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this is possible. Read on. Verse 26. He shall pray unto the Most High, and he will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy. For he will render unto man his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. Mm, you see that? Instead of coming with an excuse, or finding of an excuse to your, to your way, the Bible says, he looketh upon men, and if any shall say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. Meaning, I sinned, I dealt with things according to my flesh, I, did with, I dealt with things according to my own way, and it did not profit me. Then what will happen? Verse 28, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. He shall deliver your soul from the pit. You shall find repentance, but you must seek repentance. You must properly repent, not find an excuse according to your way. Read on. Verse 29, lo, all these things work at the most I oftentimes with men, to bring back his soul from the pit, to en enlighten with the light of the living. Mm -hmm. Verse 31. Let's sit on that. Okay. Let's go to, um, let's get a few more here before we move forward. Mm -hmm. Let's go to uh, Psalm 78 and 20. Mm -hmm. The book of Psalms, chapter 78, verse 20. Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Verse 21. Therefore, the Most High heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, mm. and the anger also came up against Israel. Verse 22. Because hold, hold up. <laughs> Read verse 20 again. Verse 20. Behold, he smote the rock. Behold, he smote the rock. We know that Moses smote the rock in the wilderness. We don't. That the waters gushed out, mm. and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? You see that? So the Most High gave us water to drink when we were thirsty, and yet we began to complain even more. Mm -hmm. Can you give us food also? I mean, some meat would be nice with this water. Some food would be nice with this drink. <laughs> and you can't, you can't tell me that we're not the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Most High will have everything perfectly laid out for us for our betterment, for our nourishment. And we find a way to mess it up. Why? Because we can't see the blessing or we can't see the fullness of the blessing that the Most High put before us. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he gives us water to drink. And we're going to show you, um, we're going to give you some insight on this account going into the New Testament. Okay? But he gives us water to drink and we still complain for meat. Mm -hmm. Okay? And to add to that, I'll, um, it's like even with us today, mm. we will we will have the most high is giving us what we need. Mm. Food, raiment, they'll be with content. Mm. You with me? Mm. But yet still we 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 we're trying to get more mm. serving the flesh mm. as opposed it to be are we serving the most high in spirit and in truth. Right. You with me? So here's a, here's another other examples of it. You with me? Mm. Where, whereas the children of Israel were, were, you know, they got water. And it still wasn't enough for them. It was more murmuring. It was complaining. The most I sent the um the quail, the quail flying, and they put a storm in front of them, mm. so they had to divert. So when the quail divert, they got tired and landed right in the camp of Israel. 
you understand? I mean, the most, you know, even with all that, they still complain, they still murmur. Right. You know, so are we serving our flesh? The Bible says things written on four time are written for our learning. So we can, you know, if we want to see what, what Israelites did that was pleasing to the most high, we can read the Bible. If we want to see what Israelites did that was displeasing to the most high, mm. we can read the Bible. It's all here. This isn't a book in favor of any man. Mm. No, right. no man is the hero here. It really mm-hmm. this is this is the most I book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, right. want, just wanted to drop that in. Absolutely. Let's uh, finish. Uh, what verse were you in? Verses uh, twenty one. I was at now. Mm-hmm. Verse twenty one. Therefore, the most I heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Verse twenty two, because they believed not in the most I and trusted not in his salvation. Verse 23, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven mm. and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of the heaven. Mm. He had given them manna to eat. Now it says that he opened the door of heaven. And, and the, the reason why it's explaining this is that we on this earth, we don't know the mysteries. Just talking about man in general. We do not know the mysteries of how the Most High's universe works and what it takes for things to be brought into our universe, into our realm. Okay, the Bible says, uh, what's that in uh, Second Ezra, uh, the third chapter, where it says that the Most High went through cold and heat and went through all these things to give us the law, to show us for the Most High to work with us and for the Most High to to bring things into our realm to operate with us. There's all types of mechanisms and all types of things that take place in the invisible that we can't even fathom. But the Most High does it in order to have a relationship with us, to to communicate with us. In this case, to feed us. Okay? So it says that he opened the doors of heaven and he rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. So in other words, he fed us with angels' food. Read on. Verse 25. And man did eat angels' food, and he sent them meat to the full. Mm. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by this power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh upon upon them as dust, Mm. and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. Mm. Talking about the quails that Mm -hmm. came, and they brought the winds, and the winds slowed them up. So when they got there, they they, they just just dropped tired. Mm. Tells in um, Josephus. Right. Verse 23, I read it. Verse 27, I'll read it again. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. Verse 28, and he let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their inhabitants and their, their inhabitations. Verse 29, so they did eat and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. Mm. Verse 30, they were not in strange. From their lust. Right. So first it says in verse 29 that the Most High gave us our own desire. We desire to be fed. The Most High fed us. Mm -hmm. But what? Read that again. Verse Verse, 30. Verse 30. They were not estranged from their lust. Yet they were not estranged, meaning they were not separated from their lust. So the Most High did his part in fulfilling our desire, our desire to have food, our desire to have water. But yet we were not separated from our lust. Mm -hmm. Read on. But while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of the Most High came upon them and slew the fastest of them and smote, sorry, and and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. You see that? So the Most High smote the chosen men of Israel. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of their lust. Because we couldn't overcome our own lust, and our own desires. And we place those things above the will of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here it is, the Most High just delivered us out of captivity from a great nation from under a great bondage. Mm -hmm. We couldn't see that blessing for what it was. We desired more. So it got to the point where the Most High, he answered our prayer. We wanted the quails, we wanted the meat. He gave us the meat. But you know what else happened? The wrath of the Most High was so much kindled at this point that he slew us while the meat was still in our mouths. Mm -hmm. Okay? So yes, the Most High will grant you, you ask for something, 
does the scripture say you ask? It says you ask and you receive not <clears throat> because you, you ask for it to consume it upon your lust. So certain things may happen in your favor that you think is the will of the Most High, and you'll be destroyed in it. Why? Because you, you sought to receive it upon your lust, your own desire. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 32. For all this they sinned and still, excuse me, for all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Verse 33. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble? Verse 34. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and inquired early after the most High. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it tells us, which I believe it's Hosea, where it says, and um, in their affliction, they shall seek me early. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the most high has to put afflictions upon us. He needs us sometimes to go through starvation and drought. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to go without financial resources. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to go without proper raiment. Why? So that in that affliction, we will turn our faces to the most high and not our backs. Okay? In affliction, we seek the most high early. We need FEMA camps. You know why? Because without those FEMA camps, no one would turn to the most high. Mm -hmm. All right? We need people kicking down doors and jackbooting and all that. Why? Because if it wasn't for those things, people would not find a reason to seek the Most High. They will live deliciously, they will live comfortably, and they will die in their lust. Mm -hmm. Okay? To some degree, you need some level of police brutality. Why? Because if everything is comfortable, then this what happens is what you see in the wilderness or what happened in the wilderness. Okay? So you need afflictions taking place upon the children of Israel. Why? Because it's those afflictions that cause us to do what? Turn our face to the Most High. Mm -hmm. Okay? And hopefully through all of this brutality and affliction we're facing, that many of us will turn our faces to the Most High. But for the most part, you see that instead of turning our faces to the Most High, many people are using these things to further the agendas of their own flesh. Let me use police brutality as a means to push the LBGT agenda. Those people will die in their lusts if they don't repent. Okay? Black lives matter. Black lives matter, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So they'll use mm -hmm. the affliction instead of saying, you know what? This oppression is taking place. Mm -hmm. Something is not right. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to the Most High and see what he has to say about this affliction. So we've, been, we've been taught to go into look to government. Exactly. Rather than on the Most High. And that's also part of the flesh. Exactly. Really, that's a, you know the, the, the only thing a government can do is address is the flesh, and they don't even do that. So exactly. So we, it's not like we're getting any flesh rewards from this government establishment. So we must turn back to the most. That's right. Sorry, man. Just have to add that's, that to that's, that's perfect because the scriptures tell us that what we trust an oppression and stay thereon. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go down into Egypt for their protection, for their horses, for their strength, for their weaponry, mm -hmm. for them to support us. OK. But the Bible is telling us to turn to the Most High. Mm -hmm. All right. Why? Because the, the Egyptians are men and their horses are flesh. Mm -hmm. They can't save us in a time of trouble. So instead of saying, let's open our Bible, let's see what the Most High has to say about this affliction and this brutality. We use it to bring forth an agenda to further serve our own flesh. Mm -hmm. OK. You have something? No, it's not mm -hmm. you, can, you read it. The book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 12. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Mm -hmm. So we trust in oppression and stay thereon. Mm -hmm. And we'll even use it to put forward our own agenda. Mm -hmm. That's how sick we've become as a nation. Okay? Mm -hmm. But you see, in this time, the Most High put that affliction upon us, and we did the right thing. We turned our, we turned our faces to the Most High, not our backs, and we began to repent, mm -hmm. understanding that that's the only way that we can be delivered from our affliction. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 35. And they remember that the Most High was their rock, and the, high, and the Most High their Redeemer. Sorry, I think I, I missed a few, a few verses here. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me jump back up to verses um, 33. Uh, where it says they are. 
33. Therefore, their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and inquired early after him. Mm. Verse 35. And they remembered that the most high was their rock and the most and, and the high power their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. Mm -hmm. Verse 37. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. For their heart was not right with them, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. Mm -hmm. You see that? So we began to give the Most High lip service. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're going to further elaborate on this point going into 1 Corinthians uh, 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we gave the Most High lip service. We prayed to the Most High. This, is, this happened all throughout the 40 years we were in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. We were crying to the Most High, God, please take this affliction off of us. And the Most High would take away the affliction. And then as soon as, no sooner as the affliction is off of us, we're back to the same evil. We're back to the same iniquity. We're back to serving our flesh above our God. Okay? So they were not steadfast in the covenant. Their hearts were not right with the Most High. Okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 1, elaborating on this journey in the wilderness and the message that the Most High wants us to receive of this uh uh, this wilderness uh, uh, travel that we went through for 40 years, according to the new covenant. This is the new covenant message that the Most High wants us to receive from that historical event. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's read 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you should be ignorant that how all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud mm. and in the sea. Verse, verse three, and did eat the same spiritual meat. And did eat the same spiritual meat. We just read about that spiritual meat, which is called manna. Read on. Verse, verse three, and did eat all and and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Verse four, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Mm -hmm. For they drank of that spiritual rock that that followed them. So when they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Remember, it says that they forgot their rock. It speaks about that in Deuteronomy 32. Mm -hmm. Also in the book of Psalm 78, it speaks about that rock. And when it says that rock, let me make it clear, okay? It's not talking about an idol. It's not talking about we worship the Most High in the form of a rock. Mm -hmm. That word, tazawar in Hebrew, means a foundation or an enclosure, a protection, mm -hmm. okay? So that same spiritual rock, meaning that spiritual foundation or that spiritual protection that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that rock was Christ. So that, that spiritual being that was with us in the wilderness, communicating with us, protecting us in the wilderness, was Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? The pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. That was all orchestrated under Christ. That was him following us. Okay? Read on. Verse 5. But with many of them, the Most High was not pleased. But with many of them, the Most High was not pleased. Read on. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. And we know the history of the 40 years in the wilderness. Many of our forefathers were overthrown to the point where the original generation that came out of Egypt did not walk into the land, save Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two from the original generation that walked into the land of Egypt. All of the original generation, including Moses and Aaron, did not walk into the land. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 6. Now these things were our example. You see that? See, now the Bible is saying that these things were our example. The things which were written aforetime were written for our learning. So everything we read is an example of what to do in this time and what not to do in this time. OK, and I have to I have to make this point again, a, a lot. of, And I, I understand it. We've gone through this earth for a long time without a sense of self pride and self worth. When we get the scriptures that starts to build that self pride and that self worth. But it gets to a point where it gets out of hand to which this is just Israel, 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 Israel. We're going to do this. We're going to do that without understanding the fact that the Bible is dealing with more than just the glory of Israel. <clears throat> is dealing with the downsides of our nation and what will happen if we don't 
come back to the Most High, repent, and serve him under this new covenant that was laid by the blood of his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. Okay? As we, we went into this last week, I don't, we don't care how much of an Israelite you are. We don't care how many genealogical tables you can pull out to prove that you go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't care how many slave ships you can show you came off of. We don't care about any of it. If you do not accept Christ and his baptism, then you're not the Israelite that the Mosai is looking for. Okay? All Israel is not of Israel. The only Israelite that the Mosai is looking for, the only type of Israelite that the Most High is seeking for is the Israelite that is in Christ. Anything outside of that is a Gentile. Okay. Okay. Let's read on. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things. You see that? So these things were an example to the intent, meaning for the purpose, mm -hmm. that we should not lust after evil things. Mm -hmm. Read on. As they have lusted. As they also lusted. Read on. Neither, you, neither be you idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. When did this happen? This happened during the time of the golden calf. And again, we were driven into fornication, as it's going to mention, during the time when the, the Moabites came in and we started to deal with uh, fornication with the Moabite women. Mm -hmm. Okay. All of this took place amongst people who knew they were Israelites, mm -hmm. who just served in the land of Egypt. Okay. Just received the commandments of the Most High saw miracles of the Most High. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is showing us that all of that stuff does not matter. I don't care if you can prove that you're the people that received the law. I don't care if you're the people who saw the miracles in the wilderness. If you do the same things that your forefathers did in the wilderness, then you are not worthy of this kingdom. Okay. So it says, they, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. When? During the time of the golden calf. Read on. Verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Right, and that's dealing with the fornication that was committed with the Moabites. Okay, it got so bad to where one of the Israelites got up with a, I forget the brother's name. Okay, he got up with a, a dagger. A uh, javelin. A javelin, yeah. Mm -hmm. He took a javelin and went through uh, both an, an Israelite man and a Moabite woman. Okay, mm -hmm. that's how sick and how bad it got in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And brothers and sisters, believe it, we're, we're bringing this out because understand that we're going into the wilderness again. And a lot of the same spirits that were present in the wilderness in ancient times will be present in the wilderness in this time. And there's going to be a lot of Bloodshed, there's going to be a lot of death taking place at that time. And I'm not saying that, you know, men is going to be coming and, and, and committing judgment or enacting judgment upon people. We're saying that the same way that the Most High enacted judgment back then, judgment will be enacted again in the wilderness in this future time. Mm -hmm. All right. You got something on that? I'll read on. Okay. All right. Uh, read on. Verse nine. Neither let us tempt Christ. Are some of them that also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Right. So we cannot tempt Christ in the same fashion that our forefathers tempted the Most High in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Read on. Verse 10. Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Mm -hmm. Verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonishing, ad, ad, admonishing, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So it's written for an example and admonition upon whom the end of the world is come. Brothers and sisters, we are in the end of the world, and these messages, these writings, these records are written for us. So brothers and sisters, understand that the time we're coming into is going to be imperative, it's going to be important for us to learn to serve the Most High above our flesh. Because if we don't, we have the example of what will happen to us. Okay, we just read it. All right. So, is there anything else before we close out with Q and A? No, I'm good. All right. So, of course, there's more within the document, but I, I think mm -hmm. we covered uh, quite a, a lot of ground mm -hmm. uh, dealing with this 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 lesson, this concept, and hopefully, you will receive this concept 
a good mind and a good spirit. Okay. So with that, I'm going to say bless you all and shalom. And at this time, we're going to uh, do some Q&A. Shabbat. Shabbat. How you get the screen big again? Um, your one is control and the plus sign. Two. Or down control. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. Did you see it pop out the chat? All right, now we're going to try to cover as many questions as possible, but do understand that what happens sometimes is that so many questions come through at once um, that we're not able to uh, catch everything that comes through. So from time to time, what we'll do is we will uh, pause it so that we can get to uh, some of your questions here. Yeah, I don't know what's going on on this side. Okay. Let me see if I can get to the questions here. Okay, I see a few questions here. And before that, someone mentions the uh, book of Nicodemus. Is it authentic? Uh, there is some good information within the book of Nicodemus, but um, let's let's deal with that first because we get a lot of questions on that. And then we're going to deal with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's another question we get quite often. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let's first get the understanding of who Nicodemus was. Let's go to the book of John, third chapter. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. uh, John three and one, we'll just get a little bit of history of who Nicodemus was before we go into um, why it's important that even though a lot of records out there may have good information, um, the importance of filtering through any record that you may come across. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, John chapter three, verse one. Over here. Mm -hmm. The book of St. John chapter three, verse one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, mm -hmm. a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yeshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from the Most High. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except the Most High be with him. Right. So based on what we've just read, we know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews, meaning he was a chief man amongst the Jews. Okay. We also know that he came to Christ by night to be taught of Christ. And he also acknowledged that Christ was a man sent of the Most High, for no man could do any miracles such as Christ did, except he be sent of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we know about Nicodemus. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was also, uh, him along with Joseph of Arimathea, were responsible for anointing Christ um, after he was... Uh, after he was taken down off the cross. Mm -hmm. So I believe it was Nicodemus along with Joseph of Arimathea who were who had a key part in burying Christ, mm -hmm. okay, giving him an honorable burial. All right, so. And while uh, Joseph, Christ's father, approached Nicodemus mm -hmm. um, when they wanted to stone Mary, so he right. said, this is my child. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so that a lot of that information there's this good information within the record of nicodemus but i have to say this because what happens is we go into many different records okay throughout the course of our teachings you may see us use the apocrypha which many people are not familiar with uh you may see us use uh jasher okay uh you may see us use uh the book of jubilees or the book of enoch am amongst many other records right and for some people, that may be somewhat a license to go into every single book out there that's labeled as a hidden book. Mm -hmm. Okay. When for some books, 
There's a reason why they're not in the Bible. Okay. Like, for example, Jasher is not in the Bible because it was not a part of the original scrolls that were compiled uh, as far as the translation of the Bible. But yet it is mentioned within the Bible and it's therefore a good record to read. Okay. And even this being mentioned within the Bible, when we read the book of Jasher, we filter everything in Jasher through what? The Bible. Okay. Same thing with Enoch, same thing with Jubilees. We use the Bible as the foundation, right? Now, there's other records which do not belong anywhere near the Bible, okay? There's certain records like, okay, the Gospel of Thomas, okay? Uh, the, la well, what do they call it? The Laughing Gospel of Barnabas, or the, the Gospel of Barnabas that the Muslims use, mm -hmm. okay? Um, a lot of the, um, the Gnostic Gospels. These things don't belong anywhere near the Bible or any other record that is in connection with the Bible for good reason. Why? Well, the Bible gives us insight on how to judge a record. OK, here's an example. OK. Let's go to the book of. Uh, let's get let's first get uh, Ecclesiastes 12 and, and 12. And let's go back into the Old Testament to see an example of how you try something to see it, if it's of true value or good value. Mm -hmm. Okay. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 12. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end. And much study is weariness of the flesh. Right. So of the making of many books, there is no end. There's so many books out there in the universe that you would weary yourself out. You would you would tire yourself literally just trying to comb through every single book to find out what's in it. And in the process, you'll waste a whole lot of time because uh, the reality is that a whole a, a lot of books out there are just not worth reading. OK, mm -hmm. uh, you're getting. Um, what you, what you got there? Um, ever studying. Ever oh, yes. Learning. Oh, yes. Let's get that. Ever learning. Mm -hmm. The book of First Timothy, chapter 6, verses... Um, That um, you there with you. That's six. Anyway. All right, we're going to ever learning. Then we're going to go back into the Old Testament, and we're also going to go back to Ecclesiastes twelve. Okay, because the Bible says that much study is a weariness of the flesh. Right. Uh, here we are, 2 Timothy 3, that's the one. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy uh, 3, verse 7, it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right, that's what happens when you begin to study all of the different books mm -hmm. that have ever been written on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, you will be ever learning, you'll have a new breakdown on something every single day, every single minute of the hour of the day, you'll have something new to bring forth, but you'll never truly come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because with all these different records in the earth, they all have conflicting information. Mm -hmm. One book is to push one philosophy. Another book is to push another. And because you have not built a firm foundation in Christ, you'll find yourself falling for each and every philosophy that you find within these books. Mm -hmm. For example, many people have been taken by the quote unquote Essene gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the book is written in, in such a way that to, People will read it and think that this is inspired by the Most High. And they'll create a doctrine saying, well, based on the Essene gospel, we're not supposed to eat meat. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be vegetarians. Well, um, I believe in the Bible. And when I go into the Bible, the Bible makes it clear in Leviticus 11, the clean food and the unclean food. It also makes it, makes it, makes it clear in 1 Timothy 4 that it's a doctrine of devils to tell someone to abstain from meat. Okay. 
So the Bible makes it very clear. No one brought the animals on the ark. Exactly. No one brought the animals on the ark. If the Mosai didn't want meat to, to be consumed, why would he even refer to the, the meats as clean and unclean? Why would there be a need to differentiate if they were not for consumption? Okay. Paul's, yeah, exactly, Passover. He said what? Kill a lamb. You guys eating grass of us weird. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> All kinds of philosophies people come up with and what they do, like the Bible speaks of cunningly devised fables, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do within the Essene gospel, I believe that they'll, wherever it says meat, they'll substitute and say, well, it wasn't talking about meat. It was talking about a plant that's, uh, that has the same name as a piece of meat or some garbage that, you know, people will come up with, you know, where the most I didn't mean that he meant this. Okay, John didn't eat locusts and wild honey. He ate the locust plant and honey. <laughs> right, come on, man. Let's yeah. just just quit it, man. Awesome. All right, just just stop. Okay, the Bible is very clear on what it says about consuming meat. But again, I'm I'm, I'm mentioning this point for a purpose. When you do not find when you do not establish your foundation in the Bible, and you start to go into so many different other books, you're going to fall for the the pitfalls and the traps that exist within those books. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. To the law and to the testimony, mm -hmm. it's not according to this word, is because there's no light in that. Let's let's get that. Let's let's read that in case they didn't hear. Uh, Shapat read that. Isaiah eight and twenty. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to show you some ways on how to validate or find what which books have validity according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. The book of Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word. If they speak not according to this word. It is because there is no light in them. It is because there is no light in them. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a record and it's obviously stating something that's different than what the Bible says on a particular topic or subject, mm -hmm. then you know that book, I got to push that to the side. OK, it may have some true information or insight on this particular point, but for the most part, that book has to be pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. what else you have? Second John, chapter one, verse nine. Whosoever transgresseth and abided not in the doctrine of Christ mm -hmm. hath not the most high. Have not the most high. He that abided in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the father and the son. There you have it. Read on. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine. If it brings not the doctrine of Christ being the son of God and the most high being the father of Christ. Read on. Receive him not into your house. Receive him not into your house. Now this is speaking of a man, but that same standard can be used for a book. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes for what the Bible speaks about in the Old Testament, false witnesses. Mm -hmm. We know that false witnesses, that's a law speaking about men mm -hmm. giving false witness. Well, I can give that same standard. I'm going to let you in in a moment. I can give that same exact standard for a book. Mm -hmm. So if I examine a book and that book is giving a false witness that cannot be validated mm -hmm. by anything in the Bible, mm -hmm. then that's a false record. Mm -hmm. Okay, what you what you have? No, just to say that the doctrine, a lot of these books goes off into doctrine. Right. Like for example, um, you mentioned it earlier, the the the, the Barnabas. Mm. Barnabas is 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 total blasphemy, blasphemy, mm. going against the doctrine of Christ. So when you see these things coming, the books coming, a lot of these books, if you understand the doctrine of Christ, mm. then you can easily well, okay, go, okay, all right, cool, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that mm -hmm. and work it like that. So it's the same thing. If anybody come and not bring in the doctrine of Christ or the doctrine of what the scriptures is alluding to them, then forget that. Forget, you can just discard that. That's a way of judging, of looking at it. So when you go into, for example, the book of, um, of Joshua, nothing is going on in Joshua that goes against the doctrine. Right. Nothing is going on in Jubilees that goes against the doctrine. Right. So you can use that to then, to, to then, you know, to see if, if a book come in telling you that, listen, we're not supposed to eat meat when clearly in the book from Genesis, 
they, they, they just, you know, from Adam, Adam all the way down were eating meat because of animal sacrifice because of sin, then you know right away then that something is up with this book. Mm-hmm. And you can sieve it that way. You can get, okay, I, I can get rid of that. You understand? But if you're new to the truth and you're just coming in, the Bible says in Isaiah 34, 16, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, stay here. Right. Hebrews 5 and 12 says, for in the time we are to be teachers, we have need that one teach us again. So sometimes we have to just be careful of what, what's been pushed out there and just, you know, let's start with the 66 and the 14 taken out. Mm-hmm. Let's start with that. Simple. Okay? Yep. All right. Just leave it there. All right? Now, the other one, someone had a question on um, um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Let's mm-hmm. let's move on to that one. Okay. I'm in the book of Matthew, the 12th chapter. Tell you, you can break it down. Mm-hmm. Matthew 12, verses 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him in so much that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. Verse 23. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? Right. Now check out the example that we have of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Christ just performed a great miracle of healing. Keep in mind that we just read that Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, who himself was a Pharisee, said that we know that you are a man of God, mm-hmm. meaning your works are divinely inspired through the Most High and his Holy Spirit, where we have never seen a man do miracles like this. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's plain that Christ is operating and healing in the spirit of the Most High. OK, now let's see how this is being perceived by the scribes and the Pharisees. Yeah. <clears throat> Verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doeth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Right. So now what the scribes and Pharisees did were they were, were was that they attributed the work of the Most High and the Holy Spirit to Satan. Mm-hmm. So how does this relate to blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Well, if every good work that's performed in the earth through the spirit of the Most High is attributed to Satan, who can now come and determine whether, you know, based on the works being of the Most High, that now I'm going to come and serve the Most High based on these works? Mm -hmm. Because now everyone would attribute that good, powerful work in the Most High to Satan. Mm -hmm. So people are not going to deal with it. I'm not going to deal with that. That's Satan's work. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, but read on. Verse 25. And Yeshua knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Right. In other words, Christ said if he's working for Satan, then he's doing a horrible job. Mm-hmm. Because everything that Christ did was in, in, uh, in contrast to Satan, fighting against, fighting against the, the kingdom of Satan. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he was a horrible servant of Satan. Mm -hmm. Right? Read on. Verse 26. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Mm. Verse 27. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Right. So if I am casting out spirits by the power of Beelzebub, then by which power do your children cast out spirits? Are you also using Beelzebub? Okay. Now keep in mind, we know that Christ was not dealing with Beelzebub. It was obvious that he was anointed by the Most High and the Holy Spirit to perform these miracles. Okay. Read on. Therefore, they shall be your judges. Mm -hmm. Verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of the Most High, then the kingdom of the Most High is come unto you. Mm -hmm. Verse 29. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Mm -hmm. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Right. So if you're not working against the kingdom of Satan to cast out Satan, then you're against Christ. Simple and plain. Mm -hmm. Read on. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Right. 
Why? Because that's that that Holy Spirit, the sign that come upon one that has the Holy Spirit, that's one of the greatest signs that we have that someone is working with the Most High and that the Most High is using this person as a vessel. So if that spirit gets demonized and everyone gets starts to attribute that spirit to Satan, now you start to take souls from the Most High. Those who would now come to the Most High based on those great miracles of healing will draw back and say, well, I don't know. That, that may be the power, the, the, the spirit of Satan that this person is working with. Okay? So you cannot demonize the Holy Spirit. That's a sin that cannot be forgiven. Okay? Is there any more on that? No, that's it. Okay. You have anything else on that? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Answer the question. All right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Someone asked, is there forgiveness of sin, uh, forgiveness after baptism if we sin? Okay. The answer is yes. There is a way to repent after being baptized. Okay. Mm -hmm. First Peter four and eight. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it says here, and there's a few more like in James and all that. Mm -hmm. can, can bring that up. Yep, you bring bring out all, all, all that you got. Okay, the book of uh, First Peter chapter four verse eight, and above all things, that fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. For charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even after a baptism, if you if you fall short, the Bible says a just man falleth seven times, right? And he gets up again, but the wicked shall stay in there, you know, shall, in other words, stay in their fall. Mm -hmm. So if you fall short, there's ways you can redeem yourself. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be with a double mind and an evil heart. What do I mean by that? You can't go out and commit a sin and say, you know what? After I sin, I'm going to do something charitable so that I can be restored and I can repent. That's not how the Most High deals. The Most High is not dealing with someone who has prepared their fat beast, mm -hmm. okay? Understanding that they're about to commit a sin and now they're going to try to offer up that fat beast. Mm -hmm. You have to be genuine in your walk, in your repentance. If you fall short, you got to seek repentance with sincerity. OK, mm -hmm. so I want to make that clear. This, this is not a bargaining thing where I'm going to make sure I've got all my charity together mm -hmm. before I go ahead and sin. And I'm going to use it or perform these these acts of charity afterwards so that the most high, he got to forgive me. He said charity shall cover a multitude of sins. No, nah, the most high ain't got to do nothing. He shall have mercy on whom he shall have mercy. Right. And on whom he judges or bring of judgment, he will judge. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Read on. Um, yeah, that was it there. Mm -hmm. I don't want, if you wanted to get more of it. Yep, get a, get a few more. Okay. I see you have one in James. Yeah, go James, yeah, yes. Uh, James 5, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Is any sick among you? Let him call mm -hmm. for the elders of the church. That's it. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Most High. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Mm -hmm. That's right. So sit on that. yeah, so letting you also know that even illnesses we spoke about it earlier can result can is a result of sin. So when the when when the prayer and the laying on of hands, which is also a part of the doctrine of Christ, will actually have to remove the sins for the healing to take place. Mm. So they have to pray, anoint him so the so the soul, and anoint him so the sin sin moves, so the healing can come in. Exactly. Simple. Right. And that, that makes it very clear that if any have son have sinned. His sins shall be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that's that. That pretty much answers that. Um, how can you tell if your dream is sent by the Most High? Very good question. Very good question. We and I, you know, I kind of expected that question. Anytime we go, anytime we go into dreams, we get that particular question. So to answer that, let's go to uh, Sirach, uh thirty-four. Mm -hmm. Thirty-four and one. The book of Sirach, chapter 34, verse 1. The hopes of a man void of understanding are vain and false, and dreams lift up fools. So the Bible says dreams lift up fools. Read on. Whoso regarded dreams is like him that catcheth at a shadow, 
and follow it after the wind. Right. So the same way you can't catch a shadow, the same way you can't catch a wind, you cannot catch your dreams. Okay, read on. Verse 3. The vision of dreams is the resemblance of one thing to another, even as the likeness of a face to a face. Right. So your dreams, within your dreams, there's a lot of things that can be revealed. It can be the resemblance of one thing to another. It can be things that you entertain throughout the course of your day, throughout the course of your week. Okay, it could be things that you watched on television. All types of things can show up in your dreams. Okay, read on. Of an unclean thing, what can be cleansed? Mm -hmm. of from, and from what thing which is false, what truth can come? Right, so if something is false, what truth can come from it? If you have a false dream, what truth can come from your false dream? Okay, read on. Verse 5. Divinations and soothsaying and dreams are vain, and the heart fancieth as a woman's heart in travail. Right, so it's labeling false dreams in the same category as divinations, soothsayings, okay, and witchcraft. That's on the same level as false dreams. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it leads you to astray the same way divination leads you astray, the same way soothsaying leads you astray. Okay, read on. Verse 6. If they be not sent from the Most High. If they be not sent by the Most High, read on. In thy visitation. In thy visitation. Set not thy heart upon them. Set not thy heart upon them. Okay, ignore it. Read on. Verse 7. For dreams have deceived many, and they have failed that put their trust in them. Because dreams have deceived many, and they have failed that put their trust in them. Okay, so what does this mean? in regards to the question, how do we know if our dreams are sent by the Most High? Well, number one, <clears throat> we have to know, or we have to understand, let's, let's get, um, let's get uh, uh, Ecclesiastes in the Bible, chapter five, verse three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have to know that a lot of things that, that may come into our mind during our dreams, again, can be influenced by so many different things. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to watch what you entertain throughout the course of your day. Because those things can have a profound effect on your dreams. Mm -hmm. Right? Verse, um, the book of Ecclesiastes, verse 5, chapter 5, excuse me, verse, verses 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business. So the things that you do throughout the course of the day, whatever business you entertain, those things can show up in your dreams. So you have to know that the reason why McDonald's is popping up in my dreams is not because there's something spiritual going on with McDonald's. I saw the advert on TV. I drove home McDonald's at least twice before I got to the house. Okay, I smelt the French fries and all that other stuff that comes from the McDonald's when you drive past it, and now it's in my dreams, okay? You have, to under, you have to be able to separate that from what the Most High is sending you as far as a message. Okay? Now, how do you determine if those dreams are sent by the Most High? Let's, uh, let's go to the book of Daniel to give an example. Okay? In fact, let's, let's go to, uh, yeah, let's go to the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. How do you determine if your dreams are of the Most High? Daniel chapter, I believe it's two. Mm -hmm. And um, let's start in verse 19. And we're going to jump down to 36. Daniel 2, verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the most high of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the same, blessed be the name of the most high forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Verse 21, and he changed the times and the seasons. He removed kings and set it up kings. He gave it wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Now, hold up. There's something very key I want you to read. Uh, go to verse number 16. Let's jump back there. Verse 16, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Right. So we know the story of Daniel and the, the image of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of an image and he did not know the breakdown. Neither did any of his magicians or sorcerers know the breakdown of this dream. Mm -hmm. So Daniel said, listen, give me some time 
and I will get back with you, back to you with the interpretation of your dream. Right? So what did Daniel do? Verse 17. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Haniah, Mashiach, and Azariah, his companions. Verse 18. That they would desire mercies of the Most High of heaven concerning this secret. That they would what? That they would desire mercies of the Most High of heaven concerning this secret. So they would go before the Most High to desire mercies, meaning the Most High giving them the wisdom and the understanding, him having grace and mercy upon them to allow them to receive the understanding of this dream. Mm -hmm. So they went to the Most High to receive the interpretation. Read on. Verse, verse 18. That they would receive, that they would desire mercy of the Most High of Heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. After what? After they went to the Most High to receive the understanding of the interpretation. Okay. Read on. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the Most High of Heaven. Verse 22. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the Most High forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removed kings and set up kings. He gave it wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Mm -hmm. He revealed the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Right. So the Most High revealeth the deep and the secret things unto men. The Most High knows what goes on in darkness. Mm -hmm. He knows the interpretation of the dream. So the answer is to go to the Most High. There's something being revealed to you. You have to go to the Most High and say, Lord, what is the understanding of this? Lord, why are you showing this to me? Okay. You have to seek the Most High's word and his counsel for understanding on what you receive from him as it pertains to a dream. Okay. Is there any more on that? Uh, can I just keep reading a few more verses mm -hmm. here? Yep. Verse 20, 23. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou power of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matters. Right. So you made known unto us the king's matters, meaning you have revealed unto us the dream that is disturbing the king. How did they receive it? Through praying to the Mosai. Okay. You asked something about uh, verse 36? Um, it just goes into the okay. gets into uh, gets the interpretation and brings it back to the king right. as to what it means. Yes. This answers it. Yep. So hopefully that answers your question. If there's a, if you have a, something that the, you believe the Most High is showing you, you have to go to Him for the interpretation. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, yes, we can do a lesson on grace. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we have quite a few lessons. Someone asked, can you do a lesson on spirits and how to cast them out? I believe we have quite a, or, or fast them out. Uh, I believe we have a, quite a few lessons dealing with the spirit of fasting and uh, demonic spirits, where they come from and how to fast in order to cast out spirits. But we, we can elaborate on those uh, lessons that we've done in the past. Uh, someone says, did the Apostle Mark go south on his missionary journeys? Uh, when you say go south, uh, south where? You have to be uh, more specific. Do you believe the scripture has been tampered with? No. The answer is no. We don't believe the scriptures have been tampered with. Okay. Now, through time and through transmission, through translation, can there be thing, can there be a, a word here, a word there that's different? or what have you, the answer is yes. But the overall doctrine and content of the Bible is intact, mm -hmm. okay? Christ is the son of the Most High, okay? We are to keep the commandments of the Most High, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, so on and so forth. Like the things that really matter <laughs> within the scriptures, believe that they're intact. The prophecy of the, of the scriptures, 
Let's get that real quick. Uh, Isaiah 34 and 16. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, let's get our second Peter 1 mm -hmm. and that's 20. One, that's one I was going for. Yep. Isaiah 34, verse 16 reads, the book of Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, and that book is the Bible. Mm -hmm. Read on. No one of these shall fail. No one of these shall fail, because what? The Bible is a book that is filled with prophecies. And not one of the prophecies that have been destined to take place in the Bible have failed in the past, and no prophecy will fail in the future. Mm -hmm. Read on. None shall want her mate. And none shall want her mate, meaning you can't try to mix the Bible with the Quran. You can't try to mix the Bible with the Book of Mormon. You can't try to mix the Bible with the Egyptian Book of the Dead or the Gita or so on and so forth. Okay? The Bible, it's its own record that stands on its own. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. For my mouth it had commanded, mm -hmm. and his spirit it had gathered. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to Second Peter, the first chapter, and... Uh, let's start up a few verses from uh, 1 and 20. Okay. Second Peter. Let's start in verse number 16. This is the Apostle Peter speaking. It's the same Apostle that Christ built his church upon. Mm -hmm. Read on. Second Peter chapter 2, verse oh, one, chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. That's the one. Mm -hmm. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Right, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. What we read in this book, what we read in this record is 100% truth. Mm -hmm. No matter how fantastical you think it is, you think it's fantastical for a flood to take place to consume the whole earth, you keep thinking that it's fantastical and that it's mythology. We know that it took place. Mm -hmm. Okay? You believe the Tower of Babel is false. We know that it take, what took place. Mm -hmm. Okay? So no matter what you believe, we understand that we have received the truth within this record, this Bible. We have not received cunningly devised fables. Read on. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Yeshua Christ, both were eyewitness of his majesty. Right. So especially when it comes to Christ, when it comes to the miracles he performed, when it came to all the things he did on this earth, understand that these are not cunningly defies fables. Because mm -hmm. you have people who try to make Christ some type of mythological character. Mm -hmm. Okay? Christ is not a myth. He's not a fable. Everything he did is written in this record, and it's 100% true. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Now, granted, we know that his name in Hebrew is Yeshia. Some may call him Yehoshua or what have you. The key point is that People agree, those who have knowledge of the Hebrew agree that his name was not Jesus. Okay, that's an easy fix. Instead of calling him Jesus, we call him Yeshia. Mm -hmm. That's still not a perversion of the record. Okay, that's using a name that existed uh, in a different language, uh, mainly Greek or predominantly Greek, in order to label Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's still not a perversion of the record. The context of what Yeshia did or what Jesus did is still in the Bible. Mm -hmm. When he walked on water, that's not that's not perverted. That took place. When he rose people from the dead, that's not a perverted understanding. That took place. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. I want to ask something here. Mm -hmm. I'll read yep. something again. It says here. Let me read it again. It says, "But we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Yeshua, but were eyewitness of His Majesty." Mm -hmm. yep. So, Peter. The rock of the church is writing that. Listen, we're not we're not heard something here. Exactly. We we were, we witnessed it. That's right. And it was it, this is key here because Peter and the disciples, when you go into the scriptures, a lot of the times would challenge Christ, and it's, they, they weren't just gonna be like, oh yeah. Well, like for example, I'll give you an example. Let me go into um Luke the twenty fourth chapter, mm -hmm. and I read verse twenty five. Okay, I start at twenty four. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. But then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, are not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, so Christ had to then go back and start mm -hmm. teach them and show them, listen, this 
was supposed to happen. Right. So P Peter, Peter and them, they would always, you know, Christ had to, you know, straighten them out. They weren't just picking up stuff that they heard. They, they were witnesses of it. Right. And that's what made their ministry so bold mm -hmm. because they saw it. They saw him come back from the dead. They, they, they were there at, at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them and 3,000 souls were baptized. You with me? When Peter went to the man, he said, listen, silver and gold, I don't have none. Mm -hmm. But the word of Yeshua, yo, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. So that's what made them bold. They weren't, they weren't dealing in fables or anything. They were, wit they were eyewitness to what, what, took, what, what took place. Right, exactly. And all of those things that you just mentioned are mm -hmm. documented where? Huh. In the Bible. So we, we don't have a perverted form mm -hmm. of what took place back then. We got the 100% truth mm -hmm. of that Holy Spirit coming upon these men on the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. of many people being healed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. Verse 17, reading from the book of uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. For he received from the Most High the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We saw that in the book of Matthew, the third chapter, right. and we also saw that in the Transfiguration, right? Mm -hmm. Where's that documented? Matthew 17, Matthew 3. Exactly. In the Bible. In the Bible. Okay, it's in the records. So all the stuff that, and really, Everything in the Bible, like Christ says this, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Mm -hmm. Everything pertaining to Christ throughout this record, Old and New Testament, 100% on point. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the doctrine of the Bible is, is there. Okay? You may have a word here different, a name there, different, so on and so forth, but the doctrine is clear. Mm -hmm. Read on. Verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard, and when, and excuse me, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, verse nineteen. We we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Read on. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. And the day star arise in your hearts. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Okay? So the Bible is not corrupt. It's men's minds that's corrupt. Okay. It's your interpretation of the Bible that's corrupt. Okay? Not speaking to the person who, who asked the question. Just saying in general. Okay? That's, that's what's tampered with our understanding of the Bible is what's tampered with, not, exactly. not the Bible. And I, I spoke to Elder Ricard about this recently, that once I understood the, um, that, the, that Christ, the Christian doctrine had no bearing on the Bible, mm. then the truth became very clear. Exactly. Because I, I used to believe that the, you know, the rolling on the, on, on the floor and what we did, you know, the, the radio show we did where we saw T.D. Jakes right. and all that, right. I believe all that was part of the Bible. So when I got the truth that, that this isn't a part of the Bible, then it made sense. Mm. So it's interpretation that men come, men have been tampered with, mm. not the scriptures. That's right. That's right. So that's that's where the tampering comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, verse number 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So these prophecies throughout the Bible did not come by the will of man. Mm -hmm. It was not man's will that Christ was prophesied to come into this earth. It was not the will of man that we were prophesied to come throughout into the Americas and throughout the four corners of the earth by way of cargo slave ships. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the will of man. That was all by the will of the most high. Okay, read on. But holy men of the most high spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And all of that information that they wrote is contained in the Bible. As it is written. As it is written. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we'll take maybe two more questions and we will, um, we will, Close out. Uh, someone says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 9, we're warned not to eat boiled meat. Let's go there. Yeah, the question is why. All right. Before we get there, keep in mind that when we read this, I want you to start in verse uh, so we can know what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see what you have. 12 and... It starts where... Go where it, it speaks about the Passover. Okay. In fact, let's yeah, let's yeah, let's start in verse five. Mm -hmm. Your lamb. Mm -hmm. The book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or, or from the goats. Mm -hmm. So now the Mosai is giving us instruction on um, the lamb or the sacrifice that will be used not only to put the blood on the door, but to also consume for Passover. So keep that in mind as we read down to verse 9. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is for solely for the preparation of the Passover lamb. Read on. Mm -hmm. Verse six. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Mm -hmm. Now, hold up. Let me use this as an example to try to, to kind of bring some enlightenment. Right. When you buy meat from the store, right. Do you take that meat and hold it until the 14th day of the year? Or the 14th day of the first month? Or you do you wait to the 14th day of the first month to deal with that lamb? The answer is no. You buy it, you prepare it, you eat it. Why? Because that meat that you buy from the grocery store, it's not in preparation for a Passover lamb, as was done in the Old Testament. Okay? Read on. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. All right. So do the whole household come together? Of course, you don't get fresh live lamb. OK, but if you do, let's say hypothetically, does the whole community come together and watch that thing being slayed? Or do the whole family come down and watch you do what you, you know, does, is that necessary for you to eat your food or to, to, to prepare your food? The answer is no. Why? Because this instruction is solely for the preparation of a Passover lamb opposed to the food that you eat daily. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. Verse 7. Well, let me finish off verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two sides, side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh that in that night, roast with fire. Roast with fire. That's the key there. Exactly. So that Passover lamb for its consumption could only, as far as preparation, could only be roasted with fire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Read on. And unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sudden. Eat Yep, go ahead. At all with water, but roast with fire. Right. So the Passover lamb was not to be boiled or eaten raw, but it had to be roasted with fire. So in other words, everything that the Most High gave us as far as instruction, we had to follow it exactly, whether it made sense to us or not. Mm -hmm. This isn't saying that we can't eat boiled meat or right. have soup. It's saying when it comes to the Passover, it must be roasted. Exactly. Simple, Simple and plain. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right. Again, a lot of people, I see a lot of people making mention of questions. Um, okay, very good one. Ifisha, Sister Ifisha says, why do Jewish people not eat meat and milk together? Is that Torah? And if so, should we be applying this uh, well or no? Let me show you the scripture they use to say not to eat milk with meat. Let's, let's get that side. Not, let's see the kid in his yeah, milk. See the kid in the, his mother's milk. milk. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's show you the scripture they use to say not to eat meat with milk. And you see the Jewish people, boy, they, you go in their home, they got two refrigerators, they got two stoves, they got two everything to make sure that they don't put meat in the same fridge as milk. All because of their misunderstanding of the scripture. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go into the scriptures to show the father of the Israelites, the father of the Jews, eating meat with milk. Mm -hmm. The book of um, Exodus 34, excuse me. 
34 verses 26, I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says here, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the most high thy power. Thou shalt not seat a kid in his mother's milk. Right. So it just says you're not supposed to boil a kid, meaning a kid of the goats, in its mother's milk. So they take that scripture and through their rabbinic interpretation say, mm -hmm. well, that means that you're not to consume meat with milk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what if, what if I boil a kid in milk that doesn't belong to his own mother? Mm -hmm. The scriptures don't say that there's any regulations against that. I would normally cook with coconut milk. Exactly. So what's your problem? Exactly. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to a scripture showing Abraham himself eating meat with milk. Mm -hmm. So that we're not dealing with our own interpretation or maybe it's just we like to eat meat boiled in milk, which I, I really have never, I don't think I've ever done that in my life. But mm -hmm. okay. But let's just say perhaps we like to have meat with milk. Let's say you like to have cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers have cheese and it has meat, right? Are we saying this just because we like cheeseburgers so much? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to uh, the book of uh, Genesis 19 and uh, hold up. Not only is this Abraham, no, let's go to 18. That's the wrong one. Not only is Abraham eating meat with milk, you're gonna find out that Christ who came to visit Abraham along with two angels, ate with him, meat with milk. Let's go to the book of Genesis 18 and one. The book of Genesis chapter 18, verse one. And the most High appeared unto him in the plains of Mam Mamre, Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So this is the Lord appearing into, unto Abram in the land of Mamre. Read on. And he lift up his eyes and looked and lo, Three men stood by him. Three men stood by him. You're going to find out that one of these men is Christ. He's the chief of these men. And the other two are the two angels that would go into the land of Sodom to eventually judge the land of Sodom and take out Lot and his family. Read on. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. Verse three. And said... My Lord, my Lord, this is him speaking to the chief of those men, which was Christ. Read on. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Mm -hmm. Verse 4. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. Right. So he's being hospitable to these three men. Read on. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts. Right. Now let's see what Abraham asked to be prepared for these men for consumption. Let's jump to verse six. Verse six. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the, the herd. All right. So Sarah, get some bread together. These men are hungry. Read on. Verse seven. And Abraham ran unto the, the herd and fetch a calf Tender and good. So he sent the young men to fetch a calf, or he, he went and he got a calf, tender and good. Read on. And gave it unto a young man, and he hastened to dress it. And he said, listen, hurry up and get this food together. Get this thing together. These, these men are hungry. These are our guests. Okay. Read on. And he took butter. He took what? Butter. Butter? Where does butter come from? Last I checked, butter comes from milk, right? Read on. And milk. And milk. Read on. And the calf. And the calf, the meat. Read on. Which he had dressed. Which he had prepared. Read on. And set it before and them. And set it before them. Let's see what they said. Read on. And he stood by them under the tree. And they did eat. Oh, no, that's against Torah, Abraham. They did what? And they did eat. And they did eat. So Abraham, Sarah, the young men. And the three men, two angels who went to go judge the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the chief of them, who was Christ, sat down and ate a calf with butter, bread, and milk. Simple and plain. 
Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> this this Nux Essene doctrine. It, it kills the Essene doctrine. Because it never said meat here. It says a calf. <laughs> <laughs> See that? And those are those are the things that people will use. They don't say meat. Say no. Nah, that's foolishness. Okay. They don't say you can't misinterpret this. Exactly. This is a calf. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay? Calf. Meat. Exactly. There's, there's no vegetarian calf, so no no calves <laughs> made out of lettuce. Okay, this is a real calf, a real cow here that they're dealing with, right? <laughs> maybe maybe tofu calf. We, who knows, right? But let's let's see here. Let's get one more question before we close out. Again, the questions that they're, they're spotted all over the place based on the consistency that they come in. So if we didn't get your question, we're sorry. Okay. All right. One more question here. Let's try to find one that's frequently frequently asked here. Someone says, how do we excuse Paul's stilling when the Messiah told us to take nothing? Uh, let's let's go to uh, Second Corinthians eleven and eight. Let me see the rub from the churches. Mm -hmm. Let me go to um, First Corinthians eleven as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, let's get that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians eleven. Verses is it eight? Let's start uh, read eight and then we're gonna jump back to different mm -hmm. context. Okay. All right, let me start by <clears throat> verse seven. Mm -hmm. Have I committed an, an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of the most high freely. Paul so, did what? For I have preached to you the gospel of the most high freely. So Paul preached the gospel of the most high freely mm -hmm. without charge. Mm -hmm. What you're about to go into? Yeah, I mean, that, that was what, you, what the question was asked that Christ said, take nothing. Paul took nothing. Exactly. That's, what, that's, what, that's what's going on here. Exactly. He took nothing for his own acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Read on. Verse 8. I rob other churches taking wages of them to, to do you service. I did what? I rob other churches taking wages of them to do you service. What does he mean when he says he robbed other churches? Okay, you got the precept. Mm -hmm. Let's read the precept there. Okay, I'm in the same book of Corinthians, um, First Corinthians, chapter nine. I'm starting up uh, the first verse. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Yeshua Amashiach, our Savior? Are you not my works in the Most High? Mm -hmm. Verse two. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am. I am to you. Right. So if I'm not an apostle to others, I am doubtless an apostle to you based on the labor and the work that I've instilled within you. Mm -hmm. Speaking to the church of Corinth. Mm -hmm. Read on. For the seal of mine apostleship are you in the Lord. Mm. Mine answer to them that examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the, the, the brethren of the Most High and Cephas, or I only and Barnabas have not we the power to forbear working. Verse 7, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Mm. Who goeth to war at his own charges? Meaning, when it's time to go to war, who goes into their own pockets to fund the war? Mm -hmm. No one. When this government goes to war, what do they do? They take Tax. your taxes mm -hmm. to fund their war. Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. Who planted a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Who planted a vineyard, a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Meaning, Paul planted the vineyard of the church of Corinth. He planted and instilled the spirit of the Most High in those people. Mm -hmm. Should he not reap the benefits of what he instilled in the church of Corinth? Read on. Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of mm -hmm. the flock? Mm -hmm. Verse 8. Say I these things as a man, mm -hmm. or say it not the law the same also. Mm -hmm. For it is written in the law of Moses, 
Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth the corn. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth the corn. We're getting the context of what Paul was saying when he said, I robbed other churches. You're going to find out he's not talking about stealing mm -hmm. from other churches. Okay, let's get the understanding. Read on. Do it, the most I take care of the oxen or say it, he it all together for our sakes. Mm -hmm. For our sakes, no doubt, mm -hmm. this is written, that he might plow it, excuse me, that he that plow it should plow in hope, and that he that thresh it in hope should be partaker of his hope. Right, so he that ploweth, ploweth in hope. When you're out there in the fields and you're plowing, you're plowing with the hope that you will receive a harvest for your rewards mm -hmm. or for your labor. Okay, you're not. Yeah, I would like to say something on that real yep. quick. Go ahead. Okay, hope is in the context of uh, what you all teaching. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. I hope. Let, let me make sure. Mm -hmm. yep. A minute, they can see me here. Gotcha. Yep. Okay, great. I hope this is in the context of um, of what y'all showing today. Mm -hmm. Okay, shalom. <laughs> um, uh, when it says rob. Most people look at that as him stealing from the church mm -hmm. when you look at that in context, mm -hmm. right? And I see a lot of people out there using this to say uh, they don't understand Paul right. based on certain circumstances like he robbed and did this. Or, right. You understand? Let me make this clear. Okay. It's dealing with perspective. Mm -hmm. All right. For those who don't know, who, who haven't studied the churches, OK, you would have the Church of Corinth, which was more so a fruitful church, a growing church that was established with Paul sowing Christ into the church and bringing forth the doctrine that would actually have the church flourish. Mm -hmm. Now, in Paul's absence, you had others who were put in place, who was baptized by Paul, who had, you know, their own objectives of what they felt the church should do and how the finances should be used. <laughs> you understand? And that wasn't wrong either because they were dealing with things on a regular basis and felt, well, okay, based on my observations, this is how we should utilize the finances within this church, right? But then they began to get carnal. They began to believe it was about them and not the original ministry that was sold within that particular area. Mm -hmm. They started becoming closed minded concerning the things that they would like to do within the church, opposed to the overall objective. It became, quote unquote, their church. You see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. So they became carnal. So when Paul out of anywhere, out of nowhere, say, well, here's the direction the church is going. We're going to put this back in line according to how I established it they would become offended. Mm -hmm. See, that's when carnality would set in. And then they would put out negative on Paul as if he was robbing from their ideas. He was robbing from what they wanted to establish there, what the church agreed to do. <laughs> you understand? So when it says rob, listen, what Paul was saying here is you can think I'm robbing, you can claim I'm robbing, but I'm taking for the embitterment of the church. I'm actually putting things back on course, on the road from the time I established this church. It's not what your ideas are solely now that you've come into the work. You are my fruit in the work. <laughs> I know the direction. So when it says rob, that means at any time he could come through and direct the church and they could perceive it as robbing or taking, but it was what he needed to continue the work, okay? And, and, and a carnal mind can look at that and say, well, hold up. This is what our plans were concerning this. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do this. We had plans here and you're, you're coming in out of nowhere in, in disrespect of what this church is doing. Mm -hmm. Paul was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> in order for me to do what I've done here in Corinth, I'm going to need this because there's other brothers and sisters who need to build like you have built. There's other place that needs to be established like you have been established. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about us 
bringing the work of Christ from one area to the next. And you don't understand what I might need the money for, but I need it so that others can plan like you're planning right here. So I'm saying this to say that uh, uh, when you have people look at these scriptures and, and point out a word of negativity, mm -hmm. you have to realize these are unlearned people who don't know the workings of how each church was developed and what were the pros and cons of each church. When they see Corinth, they don't have no understanding of the inner workings of Corinth or Ephesus. They don't know the inner workings of what Paul had to sacrifice. Sometimes, believe it or not, he almost died setting up some of these places. And you don't know the carnality that developed in his absence. I wanted to put that out there. I don't know if this was at the construct yes, yes, yes. Yep. of what you was teaching. Yes, that's exactly what, what it was. Okay, okay. Paul was taking money from one church exactly. to support himself right. in, in Corinth because the Corinthians were carnal. Right. Yeah, what happened was, and believe it or not, the people in Corinth would have been behind Paul the whole time. They would have just supported Paul, but in Paul's absence, you had people that were in place planting seeds of negative against Paul mm -hmm. that were in leadership there, mm -hmm. okay? They would be like, well, this is what we need. And it seemed like every time he come, we have to focus on what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So Paul was like, because you all are carnal, mm -hmm. what I'll do is when I come to Corinth, I'll work, I'll build tents right. and still teach you all. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they were carnal, they were looking at money at the whole time. Not realizing, not understanding that that was straight disrespect to the one who actually, who Christ sent to, to build the church, to set the church up. Mm -hmm. How dare you look at this man in which there was no church at all here. Mm -hmm. You were in darkness dealing with the course of this earth until the Christ sent this man. And then you don't feel, uh, 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 you, you don't feel bad. When you see this man having a work in your area, you okay? You don't feel bad. It's, it's like it's like you don't deal with the same emotions or spirit of Yeshia, the sacrifice. You're not even dealing with the sacrifice of Yeshia by looking at this man and now judging this man negatively, okay? So what he does is he begins to work opposed to getting anything from Corinth. He says, Look, you know what? I don't even want to take your money because the spirit you're giving in, giving it in, is grudgingly. Mm -hmm. It's grudging. You know, I don't even want, I don't feel right even taking anything from carnal people. You understand? And these brothers and sisters were turned against the forerunner of the church. <laughs> because of what? Carnality and money. Okay, I would feel ashamed if if someone who instilled Christ in me came into an area, you understand, or came to where I was and he set up the church. I would feel ashamed to see this person have to do something else. Okay, outside of me, I'm like, listen, take whatever you need. I need some more of what the Lord has given you. I don't care about this money. Sowing to me spiritual things. I don't want to see you having to work and do all these things when you built the church. You understand more examples of the carnality of, of the church of Corinth. And I'm glad uh, that you, were, I came to grab something real quick, but when he brought that out, I've seen examples. <laughs> you understand where you would have people start looking carnal into money and they will turn everyone else's mind like theirs, mm -hmm. being carnal, when it has nothing to do with money, okay? The whole deal is this. If someone has sown unto you spiritual things, shall he not reap your carnal things? Okay, and that's not talking about, you know, gallivanting and, and, and dealing with money unrighteously and mm -hmm. you understand splurging like you see these pimp preachers are doing. It's talking about how why should this person have to work in an area and come and work when he should be, when he should be able to benefit from the the seeds he's sown in the area. <laughs> but you always have what happens is you have a carnal mind crop up and believe that it was about them. 
they would come in and start heaping souls because they starting to see the work become fruitful, not realizing who planted the seed. And they begin to believe this is us. How can someone, how can Paul come to Corinth and tell us what to do? He's not around here. We're, we're working on a daily basis. <laughs> you understand? So I'm glad you're bringing this out because brothers and sisters have to understand the narrative of how these churches are established to actually read and understand the book of Paul, the books or the epistles Paul sent to the church. Corinth was a fruitful church. It had good brothers and sisters there, but it was the most carnal out of all the other churches. They were more so money focused and carnal and how every decision they made was based on how they felt about money. Okay, when it comes to honor, respect, all those things, those things were dictated to them strictly off of money. <laughs> you understand? But they wouldn't, but how much money you would have had within that area if Paul didn't come? <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Thank you, brother. No problem. All sir. Right. Thank you. All right, so that, that pretty much answers that question. So just in conclusion of the matter, Paul was not a thief. Paul did not rob, okay? You can't just read a scripture, especially in Paul's epistles in isolation and try to draw a conclusion. You have to get the full context to understand what he's speaking about, okay? Yeah. All right, so I think we can, unless there's uh, one more we can grab, I guess we can conclude there. And uh, yeah, we'll conclude there. And then, of course, for those who are in the academy tomorrow, uh, we will bring forth the academy. I understand GOCC NYC will be on very shortly. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to give way for them. And for those who are in the academy, please, we'll, we'll be seeing you guys tomorrow. For those who are not in the academy but are interested, please feel free to send an email to gathering as one, the number one at alwolf.com um, or uh, historytimes.org to enroll in the academy. There's still spots open. Um, a lot of rich, deep information has come out thus far within the, the first, just the first three weeks. Uh, tomorrow we'll be going into the, the fourth week if it be the most size will. And so much information has come out thus far, okay? So tomorrow we're in week number four, we'll be dealing with who is Edom. We also have the Hebrew lesson. And with our brother Shapat, we have the new segment. All right. So again, send an email to gathering as one, the number one at AOL.com or historytimes.org in order to enroll into the academy. With that, we want to say bless you all. May you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. And until next time, may the Most High be with you. Shalom. Shalom.